Yeah, I'm going to have to go and leave Capitol. I'm not going to miss it. Yeah. Okay. There's a shot. Copy that agenda form. Tell the board. Mr. Meeting is going to say, "Hold the board." Is he on that? <laughs> is he on that? Is that true? Oh, I was going to say, he was on the Chinese <laughs> ship. Going I was say it. Country. You're all set. Being 5:30, uh, I'd like to call this meeting of the board of selectmen to order, if I could. Thank you for being patient and thanks for coming in early on your work days. Appreciate it. Could I have an acceptance of the agenda, please? So moved. I have a motion and a second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Okay, the very first thing is we're, gonna, we're uh, here to meet the new Council on Aging Director, Linda Hayes. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Please come forward. Oh, you, you can come uh, I was going to sit right there. Hi. Well, thank you for coming. I've heard a lot about you. Okay, um, thanks. Nice to meet you. It's, it's nice Hi. to always Hi. put a name to the face yeah. and so forth. Uh, we may or may not get down to Rook Street to see you, as you know. Well, you'd be welcome anytime, of <laughs> course. Yeah. I will. You will. <laughs> Body's our liaison. We do. Oh, good, good. Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I understand you're the assistant director down in Duxbury. In Duxbury, yes. Um, I performed both as activities coordinator for four or five years and then assistant director for another five years. So it was a wonderful experience. I really appreciated being there and I'm thrilled to be here now Great. to continue. Great. Senior population, that must be smaller down there. Um, slightly smaller, not, not, not a lot smaller. Um, somewhere around the 5,000 number. And I've heard a lot about their facility mm -hmm. down there. Again, you get a lot wonderful. of overflow from other towns. Huh? They do. We do. We serve a lot of the community, actually. Yep, many from Situa do come, but we're hoping to keep them here and maybe get some from Duxbury to come to us. Great. Well, welcome to Situa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just saying you came in at a great opportunity. You know, the town right now is in a state of, shall we say, transition. Right. So coming on board. Um, you're going to be in the midst of it, so you can have a huge imprint. I'm looking forward on, to it. On uh, the future of the Council on Aging, our senior population, and um, just it's a great opportunity. So we look forward to having you on board. Thank you. I agree. And I just add, you know, as, as John mentioned, it's a priority of the board, you know, to get that area up and going. Thank so you. please Thank come you. back to us and talk to us. And if great. you have questions or needs, you know, don't hesitate to come. Wonderful. I have had calls from people already. So um, looking forward to it. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, Linda. Thank Good you, Linda. Good luck. Linda. Look forward right, to working on it. Another happy agenda item is a recognition of some of our own situate firefighters. I think there were five total, three are here tonight, a couple are on vacation. Um, I'm going to let Marty read a proclamation that we have prepared for you guys. And I understand Rick has something as well from the State House. Thanks. If um, you, know, you guys would like to come forward, I know Mr. Elliott, Mr. Sanborn, and, and Eric Nolan. Um, this is addressed to Captain Alfred L. P. Elliott, Firefighter Raymond D. Sanborn, Jr., Firefighter Robert M. McDonough, Firefighter Eric M. Norland, Firefighter John H. Bullman of the Situate Fire Department. Dear Captain Elliott and, situ and Firefighters Sanborn, McDonough, Norland, and Bullman, the Board of Selectmen and the entire town of Situate would like to commend each of you on your swift and life-saving actions on the night of November 6, 2012. By all accounts, the fire that night moved rapidly, and your professional action is in fighting at checking for house occupants and ultimately saving a Marshfield Fire Department lieutenant's life were nothing short of heroic. In the course of each day, members of our public safety teams are expected to keep people and property safe. This is their job. But there are certain events, such as a winter storm, flooding, <coughs> fire, or auto accident, which they are required to go beyond their regular course of duty. Each one of you did that on November 6, 2012, when you called upon when you called upon your considerable strength and expertise to save a life. Every day, we are grateful for your dedication, compassion, and for a job well done. Sincerely, Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Oh, don't thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I think the chief has uh, some proclamations yeah. from the state as well. Uh, along with uh, the recognition from the selectmen, Greg, uh, thank you very much. The, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate also have sent proclamations to all five candidates. I will not bore you with reading Body them all. can read them. He's our clerk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read them all. But uh, no, I just recognize that uh, these guys have been very proud. I just, I, in reading over the material, was you're at the state house and the governor spoke, as well as the state fire marshal, is that in attendance? No, is that actually, it was over at my team. They, All they right. had okay. the fire fighter of the year ceremony over there. Guys, you make me proud. You really do. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate We're it. We're fortunate. Yep. Yeah, we are. Thanks again. All of our agenda items could be like those last two. I know. Huh? Keep it going. You're doing a good job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Skip the next one. <laughs> next agenda item is a presentation from uh, the Flicker study for the, the windmill. And I see uh, let let people come and go as they need to and make some room. And Al and his group could, could come on up. What up? If they would. Over there. Go sit right here. I spoke to Al a couple, oh, half an hour ago in his office. He was kind of filling me in on, I had asked him, you know, is this the first study, the second study, and actually kind of told me it was the third study and gave me a little bit of a, a background ahead of time, which I appreciate. Thank you. And I'll let you take over, Al. Should All right, so thanks. Nicely. I'm going to actually uh, introduce and then write in the coattails of what these two folks from Vermont have done for us. Wow. Oh, they've got good stuff to uh, say. Selecting <laughs> Danny. <laughs> Selecting Danny is from down Vermont, here, so you can warmer. play to him. Oh. It's right. much warmer down here than it is up there. <laughs> I imagine it is. Barely. <laughs> um, Not much different right now. Well, in uh, 2010, the town and Situate Wind LLC jointly applied to the planning board for a permit, a uh, special permit, to erect a wind turbine <coughs> uh, next to the sewer plant for purposes of generating renewable energy for the town. This is all old news. Um, our joint application... Uh, for this permit included a study of the f flat uh, shadow flicker which is the shadow cast by the turning uh, blades and you've all seen it if you've driven down the driftway on certain days in the fall or the sp early spring um, uh, we collectively hired a company called Atlantic Design Engineers out of Cape Cod uh, and they did a study uh, which is a which you'll see what a study looks like a study is of the geography uh, mathematics of the sun going through the sky, the location of the turning blade, the location of people on the ground. Uh, so they completed a study and that study predicted that the flicker impact at the nearest neighboring property, number 151 Driftway, would be in the range of 51 hours per year. Uh, and that would primarily be in the late fall, early spring when the sun is at its lowest. Um, in recognition of this, the property owner was provided with mitigation in the form of mature evergreen trees on the property line and $20,000 in cash uh, provided by the um, uh, Citrate Wind. Last spring, the owner of uh, 151 Driftway commented that the flicker impact was greater than he anticipated, and greater than presumably than predi predicted, and uh, had made comments of at town meeting, I think you saw the um, Video yeah, the video and it was the invitation was up to three hours per day so we want to check into that so at the request of the town uh, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center uh, commissioned uh, a firm out of Vermont EAPC uh, wind energy services to complete a post construction study to see if in fact things had changed had was the certainly the Sun hasn't changed but was the turbine net of a different location a different height uh, were, the, were there some other factors that weren't considered so with me here tonight, after completing the study, is Elizabeth King and Chester Harvey um, from the EAPC uh, to present the results of their study. Also we have here tonight Niles Bolgan, who is from uh, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, who, who actually has helped uh, find these folks and paid for it, the, the study that was done. And I also noticed that Seth Pickering from the Department of Energy uh, resources is here tonight and they were certainly involved in helping us uh, uh, get to this point so at this point let me turn over the presentation and uh, you'll be live going out to thousands of people in situate <laughs> so you want to speak clearly into the microphone so they can hear you and they'll be able to see the slides 
as well as uh, people in the world. Okay. okay. Thank you, Al. At least tens. <laughs> At least tens. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, well, thank you guys for having us. Uh, as as Al mentioned, I'm Chester. Uh, this is my colleague Elizabeth, uh, and we're from EAPC Wind Energy, which is headquartered in Norwich, Vermont. Um, just to start out with, uh, we all, I think, have an idea of what shadow flicker is, but uh, for those that may not, uh, it occurs when rotating wind turbine blades cast a pulsating shadow on an observer or their immediate environment. Um, this is pretty similar to the experience of driving down a highway when sun is low angle sun is shining through the trees uh, and you get that sort of pulsing effect on your windshield. Uh, but this is a much lower frequency than that because the blades are, are spinning at a, a slower rate. Uh, so this is sort of a basic diagram of that. Uh, you get the shadow cast by the wind turbine on a house. Uh, and you can see the, the shadow is generally much larger than the sort of environment that it's being cast on. So the goals in this study uh, were to estimate the shadow flicker by time and by location. Uh, and that involved uh, identifying a number of receptors within the, the area, the immediate area of the turbine. Uh, and then documenting, documenting those areas with line of sight to the turbine because uh, shadow can only be cast uh, on a place where, where the turbine is, is visible. A quick overview of the site. Situate wind is composed of one wind turbine, which is a Sinovel 1500 at an 80 meter hub height. And EAPC modeled 683 receptors within a 1.5 kilometer radius of the turbine, which is a standard radius used when modeling shadow flicker. What just interrupt you there? 1.5 for purposes of equating it to miles, you know, quarter mile. 1.5 kilometer is what? Just so people. Okay. Just so that people understand. I yeah, sorry. As scientists, well we're used to my, kilometers. Uh, what it was, <laughs> system, but, uh, no, I, I'm terrible at it. So. Okay, thank um, you. And so our methodology, first we did a desktop estimate of the shadow flicker, which we used a program called WinPro and WASP to do this. Within WinPro, we incorporate a GIS terrain model and the daily sun paths based on the latitude and also local weather data for the sunshine hours and wind data with wind speed and directional data. The receptors are identified using aerial images and GIS data, which Chester will go into a little more detail later. And for this model, we didn't incorporate trees or building obstacles. Um, they weren't accounted for. So any forest isn't reducing the shadow flicker for this particular study. And then for the field documentation line of sight study, we did that by car from public streets. We just drove around and documented where we could or could not see the wind turbine. <coughs> Flicker modeling, we did two different cases. The first was the theoretical worst case. For this, we assume, um, well, we calculate the maximum possible shadow flicker hours at a given location and we do this by assuming that the sun is always shining and the wind turbine is always operating. This is basically um, a stepping stone to get to the realistic estimates, et the realistic case estimates, which we also did. And for those, we incorporate the sunshine probability and the likely wind turbine operational hours. For this study, we use 61 years of Sunshine data for Boston, which was found uh, from the National Climatic Data Center. And we also had one year of on-site data measured in situate, which we normalized to make it long-term representative. What do you mean by that, your normal? Uh, could you just explain that? Sure. Um, w one year of data was modeled, but it's often that one year it could be lower or higher than average, so it's too short of a time period. So we just measured it against a 30-year time set to decide if it needs to be adjusted up or down. And that, that one year is for a very specific location. The 30-year time set is for a much broader area, but you can use the two together to hone in on that one area. Um, so for another part of this was identifying receptors. Uh, these are basically the points at which we're measuring shadow flicker. Uh, such as addresses, uh, so that's how you see them represented within this study. Uh, generally speaking, we placed one receptor on each parcel, um, 
and then all receptors, as, as we explained earlier, are, are within 1.5 kilometers of the turbine. That's uh, just under a mile. Did I, did I see earlier there was 683 receptors? That's true. Yes. So you, did you put 683 receptors on the field? Yes. Yeah. Um, that, and so that is representative of every parcel uh, within a 1.5 kilometer radius of the turbine. Uh, and there are two different types of receptors, either uh, a structure receptor, uh, where you, you see represented on the left, where we would visually identify the rough center of a house uh, or other structure uh, on, on lots that didn't have a structure on them. Uh, we represent that with a, a point in the center of the lot, uh, just to make sure that we're not biasing by only counting built parcels. So these are all 683 receptors. You can see many of them are pretty far away from the turbine. Um, and then, sorry, that's pretty washed out on the screen. Uh, and then there are slightly fewer residential structure receptors, uh, 580. So <coughs> there were six residences that were within 500 meters of the turbine. Uh, those are the ones that are most affected by shadow flicker. Uh, and for those, we measured the actual dimensions of the structure based on tax records. Uh, and we estimated the dimensions that are facing the turbine uh, in order to come up with a, a receptor size. Uh, for all of the other receptors, which are much farther from the turbine, they're outside of that 500 meter radius, um, we, we used a standard sized receptor that uh, was to represent a fairly large house, so this would be a conservative estimate. So a 10 meter wide by, sorry, 20 meters wide by 10 meter tall receptor, um, as I said, so intended to simulate the facade of a large single family home. Uh, and then each of those receptors is modeled so it directly faces the wind turbine. So you're getting the maximum influence of any shadow flicker that comes off of it. And again, sorry this is so washed out, but this sort of represents uh, you know, uh, the 20 meter wide by 10 meter tall rectangle that's standing vertically. The turbine is casting a shadow on it, uh, and that shadow is what we're measuring in the model. There's it a little bit closer up. <coughs> Uh, so you can see that the receptor is always facing directly perpendicular to the line to the turbine. So uh, one of the discussions that we, we've had uh, with, with Al and others is about the size of the receptor. Uh, and uh, it's worth noting that a smaller receptor, if we were to measure just the size of a window as opposed to the size of the whole house, would produce a lower shadow flicker estimate. Uh, but it's because the shadow is so much larger than the receptor, it would probably be a relatively small difference. So here are some of the flicker results that WinPro calculated um, using a realistic case EAPC and MassEC determined two example thresholds of 10 or 30 hours of flicker per year. And WinPro calculated that there were 10 receptors showing more than 10 hours of flicker per year. And there were three receptors showing more than 30 hours of flicker per year using the realistic case. Here's a table of just the top 10 receptors. Um, you can see the address, the receptor type, the height, the width, and then the realistic case flicker. And you can see the three over 30, and these are the 10 that are over 10 hours per year. So that worst case for an hour and 44 minutes per day, every day, totally the worst case scenario, so. excuse me? Totally like 69 hours. Right. So yeah, the difference, the, the realistic case flicker hours per year is given sun shining, or given probable sunshine and probable wind direction <coughs> and speed that would make the turbine operate, that's what you would realistically have. But that is an estimate. And it doesn't. Uh, or the theoretical worst case, that's not every day. That's just the worst, theoretically, the worst day would have that many that's minutes per question. hour. It's not every day. Shining. It's right. on yeah. in the worst condition. Right. Yeah. And these results are included as part of the report. 
So for that person, 69 hours, and the estimate was 51 hours. And yeah, we, yep. Is that right um, now? My, yes. Per year. Yes. Okay. And I, I don't think we mentioned it later in the presentation, but we determined that some of the major factors, that that's a different number, is like we mentioned, the different receptor size that we modeled, and also EAPC had a different number of operational hours than the previous report. We had a higher number of operational hours, which would lead to higher number of flicker. Okay. Everyone following so far? Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, you can't really see. Can see thing once. Oh. Maybe I can adjust something. Keep <laughs> talking. Yeah, it's hard to see the middle lines, but here's a map of the realistic case hours per year. Um, the red line is 50 hours, and the blue line is zero hours. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the ones in between there, so, but yeah. that's what, so that's how you can look at this map and see the, where the receptor falls and within um, how many hours. So outside of the blue is zero. Not yet. Right. Inside, between the yellow and blue is five in between. Yeah. Yep. There's a, a 50, a 10, a five, and a zero line. <coughs> I think the interesting thing about this map is how quickly it falls off. Uh, you see, I mean, the, the red line is 50. The next line out, which is yellow, is 10. Uh, there's a pretty considerable drop off immediately outside. And again, those are hours per year. Okay. Yes. Why is that? Is it because of its location or the topography or? Yeah, it's because of. Um, it has to do with the sun angle, and so you know, there, okay. there's a fairly there's a fairly long period of time when the sun is moving in an arc directly above the wind turbine in summer at a slow rate, you know, in, okay. Yeah. At a relatively <laughs> slow. I mean, uh, clearly the sun is moving at the same speed across the entire <laughs> arc, but it covers a, a, a smaller arc distance in that time. And then when you get down toward the edges, you know, it might only be hitting something that's way out by the coast at the very end of the day for 10 seconds or something, and, and we still <coughs> measure that. Okay. One other quick question. In this model here, this still doesn't take trees or buildings into account. That's correct. Right. So that house that's way out there by the blue line. Very likely seeing nothing at all. Right. And we'll talk about that in a second. We also have the, a similar map, but this time showing the theoretical worst case maximum minutes per day. <coughs> um, and the, the red line is 100, the orange line is one, oh no, I'm sorry, the red line is 180, the orange line is 120, 120. the green line is 60. No, that's, that's yellow. Oh, oh that's 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 60 it's, 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 and then 30 and then zero. So again, it drops off fairly quickly away from the immediate vicinity of the wind turbine. In fact, the first two lines have no receptors in them at all. Right. Are, are there any questions about that? Yeah, right. Yes. So I think I'm probably in the. <laughs> Should we go back a slide or? No, no. Okay. Okay, so this is where we start talking about, um, this is where we start taking trees and other obstacles into account, but not in a modeling context. This is in a sort of a subjective visual context. So we did this assessment of line of sight to the turbine from public streets within the study area. Uh, this is because we weren't granted access to private properties uh, and also for expediency of the study. Uh, so this does account for trees and buildings, uh, which would block a line of sight uh, and, uh, they're not, these sorts of results are not typically incorporated into the model uh, because this GIS data is just very difficult to procure. We'd have to fly LIDAR, which would be fairly expensive. So these are the survey results uh, for that study. The red represents roads uh, within that radius where the turbine is visible. Uh, and this is, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the area, I think pretty straightforward. Uh, the driftway uh, has a line of sight to the turbine over most of its length. The access road to the golf course, you can see the turbine, um, and then certain points near the, the periphery of the study area. Uh, most of those houses along the shore are actually uh, 
don't don't have any sort of visibility because of the trees and other houses. And this is uh, just representing part of our documentation from that. We took pictures uh, from vantage points where you could see the turbine to show basically how exposed it was. Uh, this is on, yeah, this is on the driftway. Uh, 141? I believe so. Yeah, it's the first house that's not in the woods. But it's the second closest one. It's the third, right. Yes, mm -hmm. third, third, yeah, third. There's an antique behind it, and then there's also the house that's directly next to it. The, um... Yeah, and just, just to make clear, the lot that's right behind that is the only lot where an exception was made, and we put two receptors on that lot because there are actually two residential structures on that same lot, and they're, they're both so close to the turbine. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions about that? Okay, so in summary, uh, we identified nearly 700 receptors, uh, and this was uh, surely a little bit overkill, but we wanted to make sure we were getting everything we, that you know, could possibly be affected. Um, we estimated that 10 of these receptors, eight of which were residential structures, experienced more than 10 hours of shadow flicker per year. Um, at least one of those receptors, which is not residential, is the golf course building, for instance. Uh, and then uh, the turbine is visible from the road adjacent to these receptors. And that is our presentation. Anybody have any questions, comments? One, one quick question. You know how you, uh, you got the number of 69 hours of average time compared to the 51 before. The trees and stuff are not taken into account or in that number or they are not? They are not. So that, is there any way to indicate what that, or it wasn't in the first one either, right? Correct. I, Correct. So it is apples to apples. There, there, are, um, there are some differences. Uh, well, in any study, you start out with assumptions. So the uh, first study had assumptions about the size of a receptor that would be looked at, and that was uh, a window on a house. In this um, study, the assumption was made, well, let's look at what it was the whole house. The second uh, significant, a significant difference between the studies is that the um, number of hours that the turbine would be operating, their assumption was it would operate uh, 23 hours per day. Okay, in the first study, uh, it assumed it would operate a little over 20 hours per day. And in fact, the uh, the actual data from the turbine is it runs around 20.3 hours per day. So the the fact that we made assumptions in this study that would run longer. I mean, it's more opportunity, more hours when flicker can occur. Well, I guess my question is if you did, you know, how much impact did the window compared to the wall have? And how much impact did the 20 compared to the 23 have? Yeah. I mean, does it bring it more in line? I mean, or I guess then you look at the assumptions and say which one is the right one to use. The I hours, not so much, but the size of the model. Or um, I think it, it's the opposite, actually. I think that the size of the receptors had some effect, but it was smaller, and the operational hours had the largest effect because that's a little more direct into the calculation. But if you did it at the 20, the actual, what would that bring that 69 down to? Uh, I don't have a number for you. I can't do that calculation straightforward. <coughs> and I... EAPC used the higher operational hours because that's just the data we had access to with the one year normalized data. We didn't have any actual turbine operational data, so we didn't have any proof to say what the actual operational hours were on a hourly basis. That'd be interesting to find out. I mean, it seems like it'd yeah. be an easy. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, jump in there. We d the model doesn't take an input of like hours <coughs> per day. It takes an input of of wind speeds for an entire year, uh, and then and then acknowledges which times the turbine would be operating based on a cutoff threshold. Uh, and so there isn't really a, a point at which we can you know plug in this many hours per day, this many hours per day. Mm -hmm. You input a gigabyte time series into it. <laughs> I see. So yeah. you're you're saying when should it be operational, not when is it actually operational? Yeah. If this the, we use the times when it hypothetically would have been operational during the year when the wind was tested uh, for the on-site wind data. Uh, so what we're doing is we are exploring, this, since there is, a, there is a difference, 69 versus 51 hours, we are exploring uh, several options for looking at 
uh, how we might consider um, further uh, affecting or reducing the impact. Uh, one of which is I uh, think uh, think uh, sound wall, the wall that, that's along the mass pipe, for instance, or billboard, that sort of thing, to cut down on the amount of time when the shadow is flickering on the individual residents. There's only one residence here we're concerned about. Um, uh, some uh, until the shade trees are tall enough. I mean, a uh, significant number of trees are planted there, but uh, they need to grow. Uh, there's uh, also there's some technology that is emerging that uh, we may be part of a test on to see if there's uh, uh, ways to physically change how much flickering occur at a, at a particular location. So um, we're working, uh, when we are both working together on that, and uh, we'll figure out. And that's really just the 151. Al, are there any type of like uh, mitigations with the windows themselves? In other words, instead of putting up trees or abravites or you know or trees that grow, um, which we've already done, but I'm saying the next thing is to go to the windows and say, you know, is there any way of like when flicker is impacting that home, they can just almost like blinds shut it down. Yeah. Not blinds, but special that literally blinds eliminates all types of. And things like that. I mean, there were funds provided to the homeowner. In recognition that there would be a shadow impact on their house, which is in the commercial zone adjacent to the right. sewer plant and the most pile and the um, winter light. Uh, those uh, funds were provided by Citrus Wind in the amount of $20,000 to uh, help the neighbor deal with that. Uh, we're just looking at it. something we could do that is, is nominal additionally to help out. I think we probably don't want to go on the private property and do anything. No, no, I just was wondering, uh, in, in yeah. concert or in partnership with so. Situa Wind, would they consider that? I'm sure there must be some kind of alternatives that would be not so costly, but s something along that line with the windows, because if they could shut off that side, mm -hmm. granted, I, I suspect they're still going to see it in the front because it's impacting their whole area, but... Um, I don't know. That, that was just instead of putting more trees or yeah. a billboard or so some kind of wall that's kind of obtrusive, maybe they yeah. could do something more or less obtrusive. That's yeah. all. Sure. Just a quick Howdy. question. I, 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 was in, I was in Oklahoma or somewhere where they had a, they had a wind farm, <clears throat> and it was a particular area that they were trying to block the, probably the flicker. I didn't know anything about this at the time, but <clears throat> they used almost a netting that they use on a golf course, and it's very high. I mean, it actually can be adjusted, and it doesn't allow the... It doesn't allow light to pass to it, but it allows the wind to pass to it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting stuff. I think it was Oklahoma. Oh, okay. So. It's like, I thought it, you were alluding to. Al. That's what I thought you were alluding to, something along those lines. It's like a, it's a netting of some sort. And also, along that, you know, the, the case of blocking the shadow before it gets out, have we put trees on, on town property as well as their property? Yeah, uh, we have. So. Yeah, we've got a berm, actually, uh, between, uh, if you go down the sewer plant, um, you know, you go down kind of a slot like this, there's a berm up there. Yeah. And those trees have been planted on top of that. So it's, it's not a uh, huge problem to right. block it further. Okay. All right. Any other questions, found, comments? Okay. No. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, I learned a lot. Thank, Thank you very much for Thank coming all the way down from Vermont. <laughs> We appreciate it. Hopefully you're not driving yeah, back tonight. Down, uh, you what? Oh, you came yeah, down we that night? They should have been here. able to make that. Come on. <laughs> you can get through that snow. We have snow tires, right? <laughs> Probably Subarus. Well, that's good. Right I was going to say Sobs, but they're out of business. Good party Vermonters. They know how to do it. Drive safe, all right? Thank you. Thanks yeah, thank very much. You. Before I just move on to the next one, I see, see the chief here, and I, I made a mistake. I just wondered if I could ask Tricia. Part of Trisha's report was to give us an update on the storm, and I see, um, you know, Chief Judge here, and I apologize. I had it written down, and I looked right beyond it. So if I wouldn't uh, be all right with the board if I could just get this information from Trisha and the Chief. Turn to whatever tool. So I got pictures just fine. The damage, so you can give it a little more. Yeah, I have that one too. <laughs> I'll just, um, while you guys are getting ready, I obviously everyone knows I wasn't here, but uh, look like we're getting prepared for another blizzard of 78 as far as all the media that came into town that was rolling into town. And uh, they were hoping for a blizzard. I said. think yeah, that's I think really what, what they're about. looking they for. They set up, and I think I heard for the second time, Marty told me tonight that Situate made the front page of a newspaper in Las Vegas. Um, 
front page. Some destruction that really you can didn't go give happen. them an update on what happened. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll turn Dallas it over to you guys. But I, you know, I, I, I think yeah. it was a job well done. I said the uh, the, the storm came in. I believe with the second what we had uh, experienced actually we had four high tide cycles that flooded. So that was so you know, as the um, you know, each, so the first one wasn't so bad, but progressively they were going to get worse. And uh, I think this is like the best response we've had from the residents. The, they, uh, everyone heeded our warnings and the, the warnings from the, uh, the media to, to evacuate. And they did. We did not have one call for an evacuation during the storm, which is the first. Wow. So I don't, you know, I think people are finally starting to get it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really good. And I thank them. Uh, yeah, and uh, they said they, uh, we had flooding over, you know, the usual spots, you know, just along the Lighthouse Rebecca, Turner, uh, Oceanside, Glades, you know, and a few other the usual sections. But uh, they said that the, the DPW and public grounds made quick work of getting the, the roads open. You know, and for, for us it was just basically for safety vehicles get one lane open, but then they went back and, you know, they, they made it usable for the public. So the... Um, you know, I mean, the police, you know, the police of fire, the, the residents made our job easy by, by evacuating and, uh, you know, staying off the roads too, which was big. But uh, like I say, during the nighttime, when, when it was snowing heavily, it was, uh, you know, it, it was blizzard conditions out there. It, it was just treacherous to be out there. And all you saw on the roads basically were, were people working, either police fire or, or the snow plows. And they did a great job keeping up with it because every, you know, they'd go by in a half an hour, the wind would blow, would drift it back on the road. So they kept up with it. Not only after that, they were done plowing, then they had to stop and go start cleaning off the, uh, the roads by the beach to get all the, 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 uh, the, the stones, the sand off it. Yeah, they did a wonderful job. Anything? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Are you done? Yes, I'm. So, um, as the chief mentioned, we had the usual streets that had the overwash and the flooding. Glades has been completely undermined again. We have temporary fill in there. Um, fortunately, we hadn't spent the $80,000 to restore it. That's going to be done this spring, but um, it was hit pretty hard. The police department had 51 calls for service, but of those 51 calls, 38 were officer initiated, which meant the officer saw something on patrol and radioed in and said, we need more saw horses or there's an electric box loose or something like that. Compared to um, the storm last year, there were 157 calls within the same 24-hour period. <coughs> the, the height um, flooding stage was two feet lower than it was last year for this storm comparatively. Um, in terms of public facilities, we had a couple of issues again at the Situate Harbor Community Building, a couple of shingles off the roof, um, water came in. <coughs> Uh, to the carpet area and wet the carpet. Uh, fortunately, the new carpet's being laid tomorrow. Um, and the um, Situate Maritime Center fared fine. Um, I do have just six pictures, and I want to tell you what the physical damage is. Um, the DPW has been um, out inventorying uh, the, the physical infrastructure we have, the ice and cold have limited it somewhat and we're out there in full force as soon as the temperatures improve. This is actually the biggest problem we've had from the storm. You're looking at the east side of Musquashakit Pond and you can't tell in terms of degree but a good portion of that berm is gone. You see where the cobblestones are right there and then it, it looks like it changes a little bit to a different kind of stone. That's a huge gaping um, dip there. Coastal zone management is uh, coming out for a field site uh, with the DPW and Kevin Cafferty tomorrow. Um, that's going to be very costly to repair. Um, and we have a situation over there where um, there's very little space now with that berm gone. And if that Obviously, if Musquash get overflows, we have real issues going on the backside onto Hatherley, and we have brand new asphalt, water, and sewer pipes there. So um, that's something we're going to be looking at. This is a brand new deck that was put last year um, where the original seawall breach is. Um, that, that deck probably would have come down eventually even without this storm because it wasn't secured properly to the home. Um, so a lot of folks had deck issues, a lot of deck pieces were floating down Oceanside and Surfside. 
and what happens when debris goes down with the flooding is it clogs the catch basins and that exasperates the, um, the flooding. This is another issue we have. Um, this is a chunk of the seawall between, I believe, 100 and 110 Oceanside. Now that seawall is not breached. I <coughs> want to be really clear about that. The top portion of it severed from a very, very solid base. So that's not cracked. It's um, not undermined right now. But as we know, repairing any seawall is time consuming um, just to get at it from the back end. So because this blizzard wasn't something that is going to be MEMA or FEMA eligible, that's another um, item that we'll have to put on the list in terms of repairs. And then you just have another deck there. The third and final area that we're concerned about, which unfortunately is really not under our control, is this is the, um, is it North End, West End of Fourth Cliff, where the Army yeah, base then, is. Right. We had brought this erosion issue to their attention last year, and Chief Stewart, former Chief Brian Stewart, um, was in touch with them about <coughs> our concerns about this area because they suffered so much erosion. We were there yesterday walking it, and as you can see, um, <coughs> that has eroded even f further so that the roadway has now caved in. That piece of black that you see that says asphalt that looks like it has a little brown or, or orange on it, that's actually been spray painted danger. That's what it says on it, and that was on the road before. So it already said danger before it completely eroded. The fencing there, as you can see, has fallen in. Um, so that's something that Again, we are going to have to be in touch with the powers that be at the Army, but that's, that's pretty critical right now in terms of the amount of ro erosion that that sustained in the past um, few years. So um, that's that for that. I do want to um, thank a number of other people in addition <coughs> to the great efforts, once again, of police and fire. The DPW um, started um, sand, I mean salt and snow removal operations at 3 a.m. on January 1st and still has not stopped. Clearing, they had the ways open, almost every way was open for emergency access except for 7th Avenue um, as soon as the storms stopped. Um, I think I told some of you we had problems with the vehicles icing up because the weather was so cold during um, the storm. The other people, um, I, I can't say enough to, about Mike Breen and his crew, but Mike worked nonstop. Kevin Cafferty, um, we had contingency plans in case there was a problem with the seawall. We had positioned armor stone in areas in case anything happened so we could mobilize that quickly. We also have a contingency plan in place in case Central Ave should have a problem in breach. The problem we're facing now, and we'll talk about this a little later in the budget overview, is um, even though Situa has always had storms, the frequencies of this storm is what is increasing. So we had four storms last <coughs> year, another major storm already, seven major storms in four and a half years. Um, and that is, you know, we don't know what we can't see in terms of the seawalls and the underpinning of Central Ave River Street. We had flooding in River Street this time, too, which we usually don't have. I want to thank John Roser and Bill Sheehan. Um, they were here on standby the entire time posting all the storm advisories as they were written. Um, and so Bill was doing it from his home in Marshfield with a very sick child, so I really appreciate that. And John Rosa was here at streaming everything on cable instantaneously. One of the new things we did with this storm is um, we have a Twitter account, and I tweeted um, er every time there was a storm advisory that I had posted on the website. And within, I think, eight hours, there are 158 followers on the, on the Twitter account. So that's a new thing we did, but we host our own website now. So if Comcast should go down for any reason, like it did last year, even though our website is not active and we have no electricity or cable, tweeting allows people to still get all the updates. <laughs> so, um, so I think it, it worked well. And um, as always, we have a number of our state representatives reach out to us and ask us if we need any assistance. We're really appreciative of that. Representative Cantwell, Representative Bradley, we heard from. We heard from Senator Markey's office. 
Um, the governor's office also contacted Chief through um, <coughs> me, I think it was, right. after he saw Friday night the flooding images on TV and offered any assistance he needed. Uh, we knew that wasn't as serious as it could have been, um, but it was very helpful nonetheless. And um, there was one more thing I was going to say, but I, oh, the utilities. Um, we really, I mean, we really had issues three years ago with the utilities. For the first time for this storm, we heard from every single utility company with emergency contact numbers. Um, we were able to post them, obviously, for customer service, but we had emergency dial-in numbers for Comcast, Verizon, NSTAR, National Grid was here in town, and that's the first time that's happened, so I, I also want to commend them as well. Very nice to hear. That's great. Can I add to that list? Please. Tricia, I want to thank you. I was talked to you quite often, and I think you stayed here for, you know, 48 straight hours, it seemed like, you know, driving home cot, to get a couple hours of sleep <laughs> and coming back. So, um, and I saw the chief in the, in the building quite often also. So, you know, you did a great job, and you, you put in a ton of hours for this storm also, and you keep everything moving. So thank you for your, uh, your time and effort as well. I appreciate that, Tony, as most of you know, I said earlier I wasn't around. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. Okay, moving on to agenda item number six is the a vote for the solar array permit fee. I believe abatement. the abatement. I believe we had um, charged 1% on this, on this project, to the tune of, what, $86,000. Thank you. Um, to discuss if we should rescind that give it back thanks for you <coughs> good Hello. um with me is derek deju uh who is another long distance traveler just uh drove from midtown manhattan to downtown situate <laughs> this evening and arrived about 10 minutes ago <laughs> uh derek is with uh situate solar llc it's a subsidiary or, or sorry uh, limited liability corporation set up uh, specifically uh, for our tr for our uh, solar array um, and um, there's a number of entities you'll hear about you'll you've heard about uh, uh, bright fields you've heard about Sincarpa, you've heard about Main Street Power Morgan Stanley it's all rolled up into situate uh, solar LLC um, Derek uh, was uh, here early in the project when we're back in the days of uh, how do we get this thing going, it looks like there's some delays, delays, delays. It was instrumental in, in uh, pushing the whole thing forward. One of the <coughs> things we did uh, a summer, uh, in the summer of 12, was to say, get your building permit and get this thing started. Earlier on, we had talked uh, with the uh, Brightfields and the other entities working on this project that the building fee, um, we would have to look at adjustment of the building fee because our building fee is based upon uh, one percent of the cost of constructing a house. And now, you know, when you construct a house, you have plumbers, uh, you have um, uh, plumbing inspectors, wiring inspectors. Found you inspect the foundation, you inspect three or four times during the course of building the building. So there's quite a bit of of, uh, of, of uh, involvement of the town in terms of doing the inspections. And so on that basis. The fee has been established for years by the Board of Selectmen at 1% of the cost of building a house. So a typical house construction of $250,000 for the house itself would amount to a $2,500 uh, building fee. Um, as we were pressing to get started on this project, we said, get your building permit as a show of faith that you're moving forward with this project. And so they um, anted up $86,000. Um, $146,000 sh as a show of faith that they would get this project going. Um, <coughs> the, the issue is, is that 1% of the cost of this, of, of the construction of this solar array uh, doesn't really represent uh, by any margin uh, the amount of work that the town had to do in terms of inspecting it. And part of the state law is that we are allowed to establish fees uh, we, you, are allowed to establish fees to recover costs that the town directly incurs. Therefore, uh, building a house, a lot of inspections, a lot of cost. Um, but we're not allowed to establish fees that are uh, disproportionate with what our costs are because and that's considered a tax and we're not, uh, there, are only, there are only taxes, certain taxes that, that are 
been um, granted to the town's uh, ability to apply. I guess I'm not saying that properly, but John, you can chime in as you want to here. We did. Um, and in fact, that was tested uh, by Emerson College in this, uh, versus the city of Boston. Um, <coughs> And the conclusion was that the city of Boston was overcharging for some fees, uh, not commensurate with the amount of work that the city had to provide. So uh, what Situate Solar has asked is that the uh, building permit uh, be abated or rebated by 50%. That would reduce it to a $46,000 fee, which they, of course, which they've already paid. Um, and that uh, $43,000 fee, however, that, that still uh, exceeds our costs by a goodly amount. We've, we've made us, I think, uh, three or four wiring inspections uh, at, at, uh, basically just for the connection to the pole. Uh, and we made a couple of uh, building inspector visits to just make sure that the foundation uh, was right. The uh, developer, Citrate Solar, paid all of the costs of uh, the inspection by the DEP, um, paid all of the costs for the permitting to uh, National Grid. Um, and uh, so our, our costs are very, very small, which was our design. Uh, and they, they would be willing to and are asking for a reduction to 50% of that fee, which would bring it down to $43,000, um, which we would keep. And the other we would refund to them. They'd like cash back or would, would yes. we play some type We've of We've already taken the cash them. in. Right. Okay. And uh, yes, they would like, we would have, brought this to you back 18 months ago uh, but at that point if you remember there was some rancor and gnashing of teeth on our part are we going to build this thing or not tell us what you're going to do uh, in addition to uh, charge getting the building fee we said we want the building fee we subsequently said we want you to put up a, 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 um, a full amount of liquidated damages $109,000 uh, in an, in the anticipation that maybe they don't finish on time uh, they they actually beat the schedule for when they, at that point, promised they would be finished. And we kept uh, $36,000 of that um, uh, liquidated damages. So I, I have to say they've done, uh, after we finally got going, they've, they've gone the extra mile and, and the thing's operating. And there's a- Do you want to talk about that at all? Like we had, we had that discussion in your office a little while ago. I know we don't control Mother Nature, but you know, you, you, you had show me the projections on your laptop in the other room that, you know, this is what it's producing per hour per yeah. day, and, and you were quite yeah, excited. Yeah, it's, uh, it's exceeding the output predicted. Uh, if you look at uh, what should be the ideal day it ex it, uh, for that weather, it, it exceeds that. So it's, uh, it's exceeding <coughs> what the expectation was in terms of output. Thus far, we've received credits from National Grid um, for $96,000 and we've paid them $34,000. So we're ahead already in terms of uh, what we're expecting as revenue uh, from this operation. Over what time period? Uh, November? Since October, October 1st through December 1st, wow. two months. A net of about 60? 60. Yeah. So it's a little, we were thinking 250 and it's around now some of that's the yeah. startup you know in the startup we did we got credits from national grid but they don't listen but they didn't bill us for like two weeks of operation so we got a little bit of extra ahead there you're not going to go back and bill us sorry no <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so it's I, I can't yet predict exactly what our ongoing uh, income will be from this thing. We have, we are working with a, a couple other local municipalities because we may make too much electricity and we have to sell some of it locally and that's one of the little projects that assi Patricia has assigned me to go do is go s take care of this, which I am working on. But, um, and, and we've got a couple of very good opportunities there. How, so we're ahead of the game. Um, they did what they said, and I would, uh, I, I just think in good conscience, the reason you probably wonder why I'm pushing this since I'm a townie, it's just that this is kind of what we committed to do to these people. They've delivered what they said they would deliver, and I personally feel like uh, it's appropriate that we. Well, the, um, the way you just explained it, the 1% kind of covers our costs for the plumbing and meal and so forth for these inspections, but it's, we haven't 
been out of pocket nearly that much. No. Fuel inspections by the electrical and, and the, the concrete footings and so yeah. forth. So it's We really might have 12 hours of inspections right. in it right. at right. something and The idea hour. is just to cover our costs. Yeah. Right. So. And it uh, so we're we're way to the good on uh, half of this building fee. And uh, and I think it's it's anyway. Tony so. smile and you want to say something. I was just wondering how Al felt about it. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you really feel, Al. Uh -huh. oh, and also, and then well, just a quick question. Is, was there a contract? I mean, did you expect to get a rebate on this, or is it, was it said that your the fee is 1% of, of the fee, and then I, I saw a letter later that said, you know, we, we'd like to get 50% of it rebated. I didn't, was there any expectation of that, or was the It was, there was an ex, I, I can address that. And, either, and either of you, whoever. He wasn't here at the beginning, but even at the, at the time of <coughs> bidding, uh, the questions were asked by the people who uh, get 11 contractors bidding for this. They all asked about this building permit fee. This building permit fee seems disproportionate. Now, in a way, um, I wasn't authorized to speak in this matter, and, and, but we were thinking that, yes, this made some sense, that we know that on the solar, the solarized situate program where residents would put up solar cells on top of their house, we cut the, we cut the building fee for that in half. So if you put solar cells on your house, the fee was only half of the, that cost. So there was some expectation that was a path we were going down. Um, as it turns out, Tricia has looked at what other towns have done and other towns have, have uh, their, the fees are all over the place and lower, with one exception. Um, and uh, so we were, yes, from the beginning, telling the bidders and then the, uh, uh, the final contract awardee. But I, again, it's just me speaking, and me and the Energy Committee and others, that, that that was what we thought would happen, but we weren't committing the town. We can't commit the town. Only you can commit the town. So it, we, we, were, we led them down that path. And this has nothing to do with the excess. It was $32,000 worth of penalties. No. So this is... Yeah, separate from that. Mm -hmm. I guess there's a timing issue because we already have the money. It's in a it's in a fiscal year. Trisha, are there any issues in terms of if we do choose to abate this, how a better way to do it? We pay it out of the revolving fund receipt revenues, I think. Yeah. Just pay it out of the, the receipts that we get. Out of the uh, the, the net revolving from this. fund for the yeah. solar. And do you guys care how we pay it or over what period or? or what? I mean, obviously, as quick as possible, but sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I think the do we care how? I, I don't. I don't think we have a preference, or we weigh in. I don't think we we've got a dog in that fight. Let's take it a bitcon. <laughs> the Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I have no issues with it. Um, what it kind of what I was thinking about it when I was looking at it was one was how it was going to be paid. You addressed it in your memo, um, and how in a prospective approach, how do we approach it? The reason what kind of stuck with me was just the issue of we, we charge 1% on building permits going forward. And in this situation, we're suggesting that, you know, we're, it only took about 12 hours to go through it. Um, will this set a precedent for the future of anybody who decides to come in with like, look, I'm gonna be doing renovation or building a house and you're gonna charge 1%. You know, I really need to know what the actual hours are going to be because frankly, that's what we're kind of setting here, we're adjusting it. Um, so that was one thing I was going to raise to the board, which I think is kind of potentially a problem in the future. Mm -hmm. um, it's not your problem, um, so sure. it's not your uh, issue. The only other thing I had was um, it was your request to have it reduced to 50%. So you're accepting if we grant that, that's the amount that would be paid. Okay. Um, the third thing I was just curious about was. Um, what you were hitting on, which was like, when we first initially did it, did we, did we say this was non-refundable or based on the building permit, once it was issued, it's non-refundable? Yeah, we said we'd deal with the question of abatement later. And that, that was the only thing that I kind of went through with Tony. But aside from that, I have no issues with, with granting the abatement. John, one, one, oh, Marty, no, I'm good. one quick thought. If you're concerned about the 1% thing, would you consider just abating the penalty? If you think we're not setting a, 30, a precedent. Oh, the 32,000? <coughs> yeah. Well, I think the one thing I, I liked is kind of like the policy of if you're going to be asking for a building permit under kind of, I, I know there's a statute um, 
with green technology that you know that's the purview of the board to do just that because this is a good thing that's going on we want to encourage people and if it means reducing a charge that the town has I think that's that's reasonable because we're trying to encourage people and behaviors to do good things ultimately for the environment and it's gonna be better for them um, so I like that concept if we do that with other solar panels I think we can certainly I would never rest right. on that and say based on the prior practice we're willing to reduce it by 50 percent would you do redu it. reduction in the beginning, John? Or would you wait and see how it goes? In other words, because if something like this drags on and it isn't a perfect scenario, wouldn't you wait and abate it later on, or would you say half percent? Up, you know what I mean? I'd probably, if they were coming, saying from a building permit, we would reduce it by 50% when they first asked for it. Okay. It's no sense paying the town and then having to have the town hold the money for potentially a year to get it abated if you're going to be doing something the town would like to do in the first place. The only point I have is this, is this was a smooth project. It went well. Yeah. Everything was good. But we could end up into a, an, a situation where it would cost the town money. That's the only thing that would concern me. I'd have to look at it. Cross that bridge when we come to it. So I'm saying so, exactly. Then I'd be like, the costs are incurred. Then you could say these are the man hours or, or person hours that right. cause the town the issue. But That's those are my thoughts on it. But it's kind of an interesting query that we just discuss and then. <coughs> well, I don't have a problem, <coughs> like you, John, reducing this by 50%, and then if two years down the road another project were to come up and it goes along these same lines, or as Marty said, there's a lot of, whether they're legal issues or environmental issues that we Things have to deal happen. with, then we're, we're not really held to a half of 1%. But, you know. Every case in, on its face, basically. But like John said, you want to encourage things like this. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, just one last thing, as John mentioned, is there a document that says if we rebate it 50 percent then we're all, we're both both sides are good on it we're square and we right. have to have town council draft something like that or one, no, no no they sent us a request to abate it by the 50 percent and only you can waive it so that's why it's before you okay. now I noticed um, from um, T Emery post he was requesting a 50 percent re rebate value of thirty six thousand six hundred and seventy dollars but is that the amount that they're looking for okay I'm just, oh, I asked that because the half of it is more than we might half of that. That's about that forty-three. The, it's yeah, off it's by that. yeah. That's wrong. So the thirty-six is correct. No, the forty. Well, we we uh, the building permit fee was eighty-six thousand one hundred and forty-six dollars twenty cents. So just divide that. So by it would two. be forty-three thousand uh, as opposed to thirty-six. Do you see that letter, Aldo, with the with that yeah. number? Yeah. The rebate number. All right. Thank you. Oh, oh, you never. I, I think it might have been misstated in that letter that we sent. Okay. Anyone else have any more discussion before John? Sounds like he might make a motion. One last question I have to Derek. Right. Yes. Um, I see it's Situate Solar. Is it capital I as in like <coughs> one LLC? That's what the letter says here. I noticed it here it just says Situate, Situate Solar, Solar One LLC. Is there? It's, it's one. Okay, that's what I need to know. Okay, I'll move the Board of Selectmen to rebate 50% of the building permit fee paid by Situate Solar, Roman numeral I or one, LLC for construction of the solar array, array on the Driftway landfill. I have a motion and a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you for Thank getting you. it done. And Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for making Thanks Jack. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> the polar vortex. Back in there. Agenda item number seven is a discussion of in a vote for some interfund borrowing for the school department. Him. Good evening. Happy, Happy, Happy New, New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. So we're looking to do some interfund borrowing on the April 9th, 2013 town meeting as part of the capital plan. Article 3B, school-wide security, was authorized in the amount of 150,000. And Article 3D, school technology, was authorized in the amount of 150,000. So Paul has request, Paul Donilon, the school business manager, has requested that we borrow this money. So instead of doing a big bond, we're just going to do an interfund borrowing, and when we go to borrow more money this year, we'll just include that in the bond. So we'd like to borrow it from the stabilization fund and get his bills paid. So has he already done it? 
He has. So <coughs> we know what he hasn't already done. It. Yeah, we have to. Yes. Okay. But the warrant is waiting. So there was like a three phase, three three hundred thousand dollar phase project. What phase is this? Second, the second phase. That was a two phase. What are we talking about? Technology, School technology. Yeah. Technology, right? So, yeah. so this is the second phase of the um, security too. Though security's all done. We this compressed it into two. It was supposed to be three. Right. They were both three, and we compressed that. Two, two. Okay, so this is phase two of technology. Time. Yep. And then <clears throat> both things are completely done. Well, hang this, on a second. This says, well, they're waiting to be. Um, one says for processed. school school wide security, <coughs> and then the other is technology. Did they already use money for the technology uh, for the security, and now they need to the, use the. But we're going to use for security for technology. So technology is for three hundred thousand. No, they need it for both, both. But but for the ones that they were authorized for, they have school technology, one hundred fifty thousand, and security for. Well, so they've done the security. Now they have to pay for it. Correct. Well, they're waiting for the. So it's kind of confusing because the same numbers. They were both originally school technology and school security were both three phases. Right. We compressed school security into two, and then school technology came in at a lower cost and that has actually been completed so even though you think she PM thinks it's phase two it this is the last part of this part of school technology in terms of their correct um, what they plan to do with the fiber optic in FY 15 the school is going into a second tier phase approach but both all the school security and the school um, technology that you've seen in capital the last few years are done. Those phases are all done with this last borrowing. Okay. Good. Motion? Please. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to approve the sum of $300,000 from the stabilization fund to be used for Article 3 from the 2013 Annual Town Meeting Capital Improvement Plan and Item B and D as permitted by Mass uh, General Law Chapter 44. Second. Motion and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Pam. Pam. Thank you. Next is to award a contract for some um, water pipes and fittings. Thanks, Kevin. Good evening. Looks like we've got some new backup just recently about some yep. the bid results from the three suppliers. Yes. Okay. I just noticed that now. They look like they're pretty close. 290 to 321. Our, our lowest bidder was about 10% low. In this, the contract award value is not for $290,000, which it, it shows in there, it's the unit prices. It just establishes the unit prices for all the different items that the water department could potentially um, order, and it's a time-weighted average, so that we would be able to purchase, um, in compliance with 30B, all the miscellaneous parts and pieces um, that the water department uses on a typical yearly basis. Oh, it's not nothing to do with the new project? No, no, oh, not at all. Right. It's just okay. we, we do a standard contract um, yearly and then right. we can renew it every year and it's maxed out at three years but this establishes the unit prices for all the pots and pieces that they could use but not everything but I mean we listed 120 items on this uh, on this bid that they typically use and the company's fairly local in Denham so if we had to like I've heard in the past we could run to Denham without too much of a problem to get pots well it varies if it's an emergency and we found the pots and pieces in at Hoadley right down the street and they're readily available um, you know and people without water and without fire protection we'd go to the nearest location we could to get those oh, pots we would. All right. I, if need be I mean we'd use good business practice but to save you know we we have to be intelligent about it and to save a dime, you know, sometimes, you know, we have to consider it. ends up probably yeah. costing you in the long run anyway, but you got guys already at a hole, right? You right. Go all the way to but Dedham hopefully, hopefully by doing this, the water department can think in advance and say, we're always going to run into situations where we find something that we don't expect. The thickness right. of a pipe is right. different, but nine times out of ten, if they're going to do a job, they can think about it in advance, order their pots and have the pots ready on site and have them delivered because this is the, the delivered price from this supplier. Correct. So hopefully we're not in a panic running out there all the time. Right. Wh where's Sumner? Uh, Sumner and Dunbar? Dunbar is in Canton. Okay. Not much difference. And Hoadley and Sons is in uh, Rockland. Okay. Motion? Please. Move the board of selectmen to uh, vote to award the contract at the unit prices outlined in the bid submitted by HD Supply Waterworks, Inc. 
in, from Dedham, Massachusetts. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank, Thank you very much. Kevin. Appreciate it. Okay. Moving right along is agenda item number nine is an update on the market and economic development study. Thank you, Laura. Hi. How are Hi. you? Good evening and uh, happy new year. Thank you. Um, I just want to congratulations give you on your award. Yes. Oh, thank you. Let you know. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just want to give you a quick update on what's going on with the economic development study. They were originally going to present the report a couple of weeks ago, and before the report kind of went live, um, Tricia took a really thorough look at it, and. She and uh, Matt Smith, who's the planner from MAPC, and I met to discuss it. There were some um, tweaks that really needed to be made because when the public looks at this, it's not really just the economy that's discussed in it. It's also, to some extent, what progress the town has been making on some of the economic issues. And some of the things that the town does um, the planners at MAPC really wouldn't know that much about. Um, they basically did a really great job, but there were some things like the, um, the day passes that were being given to the hotels for the beaches and um, you know, some little things like that that they just didn't really have any information about. So they're in the process of making those tweaks. I'm hoping that at the EDC meeting tomorrow night, they can get the finished report then, and then they'll take probably a little bit of time to digest it and see if they want to change anything, and then it'll come back Good. to you all. Okay. I was just... So, go, go ahead. No, go ahead, Tony. No, I was just going to ask if we were going to get a copy of it to, to read before I see this. I just got this tonight. It was in this yellow folder. Is this a draft of it, Laura? Yeah, that was the original draft that the board asked for after its last meeting. That's been, as Laura indicated, um, revised Reworked. and edited. Okay. And um, I don't know when the ETA is on the final one. Um, I think the, e the, the optimistic ETA is tomorrow. Oh, good. Good. Okay. And so. EDC's meeting tomorrow night, so. Yeah. Something we want to put on for a future agenda item and ask them to come in and... Yeah, probably the next yeah. meeting. Okay. We Two postponed weeks. them. They were all going to come in at right. your last meeting, and it was postponed due to the snowstorm. So Laura's just here tonight for the update, given your agenda, and then we can have them in um, when Great. they get the final study. And they meet tomorrow at 7 at EDC. WPA? Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you, Laura. Thanks Appreciate it. Okay. General item number 10 is to execute a contract an authorization agreement for the State Library Construction Grant. Hey, Jess, how are you? Good, how are you? Jess, how are you? Like Jess, I said earlier, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I'd like to congratulate you and your staff uh, for your victory at the polls. Thank you, and meeting. thank you guys so much for putting in on the warrant for town meeting. No problem. It's great. Good stuff for the town. Keep you I'm busy for, for a couple years. <laughs> yeah. That it will. Okay. Floor is all yours, Jess. What do we need to do? Tell us. Just um, <laughs> start signing. How about yeah, that? Sign start signing. Um, so, the, <coughs> so Sean will need to sign um, all of these documents. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts standard contract form is one of those. The agreement is the next document um, and that has 37 different assurances um, I talked to Trisha a little bit about it um, just to make sure that the town council didn't need to be involved but she felt that the language was really kind of boilerplate contract language um, and then the uh, proof of authentic uh, authentication of signature um, I believe this needs to be notarized as well um, and then there's another form, the contractor authorized signatory listing. And I believe that's it for now. So these documents we need to have executed in order for us to not just qualify, but get the um, ball rolling to get the state to that's reimburse correct. us there's, after we start a, building. There's a pink form as well that should be a part of the packet. 
Um, and that is actually uh, the authorization for the first request for payment. So as soon as, uh, I think that you could submit this along with the other contracts, as soon as the state reviews them, they'll send us the first 20% payment from that approximately $5 million grant. Great. Is there a motion? Do we One have quick to, question. Uh, yeah. right, when do the shovels start at the ground? Hit the ground. Um, well, we have a year to plan, and uh, basically the language in the um, agreement states that we will have a shovel in the ground by November, December of next year. Because it does say a year from signing a contract. Correct. So, um, so technically, uh, they want it since since the grant was um, until December thirty first. It will need to be by by December, really. Great. Just, just one question. You have to have your temporary structure and all lined up, and we do. We need to have the temporary structure in place. Many overlapping, like when John said, if construction starts, could could then you make the move, or no, you have to be moved out. I think they... the contractor and the architect are going to want us out completely. They want the whole building, right? Um, away. If there are any issues, delays, the state will sometimes grant extensions. So that's something that, you know, if we get to that point and we're really struggling, we could always, you know, go to the Mass Board of Library Commissioners and request an extension. Um, but ideally, we would be out by, you know, around December of next year. And then I think later on, we're putting you and another member on the Public Buildings Commission for this project. Correct. Exclusive. Myself and Trustee Karen Canfield. Yes, I thought I said that. Okay. Yeah. Tony, I'll, unless someone else has any Tony, other comments. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, Will the Board of Selectmen vote to accept the Massachusetts Public <coughs> Library Construction Program Agreement and to authorize uh, Trisha Mancasey, Town Administrator, and Nancy Holt, Finance Director, Town Accountant, to <coughs> sign the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Standard Contract and associated forms pertaining to the Massachusetts Public Library Construction Program Grant. I have a motion, and can I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank yes. you. Good luck. Thanks. I just do her while she's here. When's that next one? Are you gonna take a the break? appointment. I was take. thinking about take. I mean, it's that's that's a, a no-brainer that we're gonna put. Go on. I thought I was gonna just ask Talking you guys. The budget. I think is what he's saying. Do her while she's. You want yes. budget? Well, you really need the budget overview before you get into. No, no, I was saying just do her, but she's got to be here for the budget anyway. So. But I was going to ask the board at this point if you wanted to take a five-minute break. It's up to you guys. I don't care, and I know a lot of people have been waiting. It's, it's up to you. This was the yeah, I'd say I want to take a look. The reason is because we got started at 530. We're planning on being here for the rest of the night. So just take a quick maybe well, five-minute break. Right. Five, sure. minutes, Perfect. And then five we'll minutes. start with, you know, Trisha's overview Good. of the budget process and so forth. Okay? All right. Thank you. Ten minutes. All right.
a sandwich. You did? That's like four. No, it's three. It's not four. It's it's two halves. That's good. Four. We want you to eat them. Oh, okay. I was eating for yesterday, still. Not now, though, Trisha. Marty had four, so. I didn't have four. And two halves. He, left he a calls half. a, he counts three that two. All set, guys? Yep. All right. Could I, could I ask that we get back to order? It'd be in seven o'clock and kind of move things along. The next agenda item is an overview of the operating and capital budget by town administrator. Thank you, Tricia. So thank you. Um, in accordance with the budget schedule, all the um, binders for the Selectman, the Advisory Committee, and the Capital Planning Committee are available um, for the commencement, I guess, of um, your official review of the FY15 budget cycle, even though the departments have been working on it since um, early November. So basically, their hard work is done, and yours is beginning. So. Um, so um, this is just a quick 10-minute overview. Um, I did this last year of both the operating and capital budget to give you a frame of reference for um, what's contained in the 800 or so pages that you have. Um, I'm really happy this was done last week before it started snowing. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And my thanks to Sheila, who spent the last five days compiling it. So um, thanks for that. So before we go into FY15, I just want to recap how we ended FY13 very quickly. Um, and I'm going to go through it fairly rapidly. We had free cash of over $2.8 million, which is um, a very positive trend. Um, our general fund receipts and new growth were up over the forecast projections and the financial team's projections, almost 852000 that indicates that we've turned the corner, I think, in building and development, and we've actually had a significant increase in building starts from dormant projects like Walden Woods and Stockbridge Woods, which were approved and permitted years ago, 2003, 2005, and then now they're active. So that helps our uh, go forward revenues for our projection. We were also to continue our investment in roads, school security and technology, foreshore protection, water infrastructure, and our vehicle and equipment replacements, and we are also able to maintain our bond rating of AA+. Year-to-date, as you know, we're doing an FY15 budget nine months, ten, eight months in advance of the budget that's actually going to kick in six months from now. So uh, we have to do some crystal balling, but we also can use FY14 on our experience year-to-date in drafting the budget. As I mentioned, we have building activity that's very positive with, and local aid and receipts are within the projections. Solar Field is commissioned and a reminder that we are the first community in Massachusetts to be 100% clean energy. And as a matter of fact, we're probably 110% clean energy and we need to get rid of some of that energy, which Al spoke to um, earlier because even though we make the revenues, um, we kind of lose the amount of revenues we can make if we just let that electricity sort of go by the wayside. And, and Al's had two meetings today with other um, public agencies about buying our excess capacity. So um, that's what he'll be concentrating on. Um, the, the collaboration between the school and the town department on facilities uh, is moving forward in this <coughs> budget. In fact, just prominently in the FY15 budget again. Um, our collaboration there and in other areas with the school department are, are working very, very well and I'm very pleased in that regard. Um, we have the feasibility study for the schools, schematic design right now ongoing for public safety. Our library is going to be built in um, the next fiscal year, so it's not mentioned um, year to date, but as we know, that's approved and will be on the horizon. Uh, we completed work on the seawall breach. We have a very, very strong and attractive looking revetment at the lighthouse that served us very well the past few days. And we've requested $8 million in additional repair work from FEMA because of the storm last year. We've addressed brown water, and um, we're also moving forward on some other initiatives. The challenges in our budget um, are that we have new things that develop, and we have to carve appropriations out of existing funds to allocate for things that we never really traditionally made a major appropriation for. Veteran services is one of those. 
foreshore protection is one of those. We are, we're um, economic development. These are all very worthy and very um, justified requests, but they are new money allocations in a budget, and we have to carve that out when we're doing the entire budget as a whole. Um, fire personnel services and overtime continues to grow. That's a function of calls and some other contractual obligations or injured on duty. Our OPEB liability increased by 10 million when we did the last actuarial study um, in October. Our fixed costs continue to grow, and even though we've been able to do a number of um, initiatives such as health care plan redesign, one of the things I mentioned in the budget message, and this is really a compendium of the budget message that you have at the beginning of the budget book, is when we look at wages for employees, we just can't look at base salary anymore and look at personal services as a function. We, we really need to start focus, and we have been on total compensation. So what is it when you hire somebody for $45,000 and you add a family health insurance plan and you add the town's obligation for pension and you add FICA and you add OPEB? And that's really the costs that continue to drive most of our budget every year um, that are over the levy limit of 2.5 percent. And as I note here, those kinds of costs escalate right over the 2.5 percent already. And oftentimes, we're sometimes in the hole before we start in looking at new budgetary requests to do new initiatives. And so that's what the balancing act is in, in getting a balanced budget and presenting that to you both for operating and capital. Um, we have this particular year really huge uh, impacts for the amount of time staff and resources are devoted to just the ocean. Um, you know, I've been saying lately we're all ocean all the time. Um, this year particularly FEMA, Community Rating System, the MEMA assessments, the MEMA reporting for reimbursements for FEMA, the hazard mitigation grants, and, and I don't want you to lose sight on that because that's going to figure very prominently in my budget recommendations for FY15, both in capital and the operating budget, um, because I think we need to shift focus a little bit and, and concentrate on it in a few other ways. Um, our capital needs for our physical plant, as you know, continue to grow, and then um, the, 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 four, the, the major initiatives I've had in the four previous budgets that I've presented have been focused on technology and facility needs because we were so woefully behind in those areas. Um, we're always going to need to be looking towards technology and keeping up with the trends and servicing our customers, but we've come a long way in that, and now we look, need to look more internally about our own administrative systems that actually are inefficient and cost us money. And so that's what the FY15 <coughs> budget does along those lines, and we continue building the facilities um, department. I do want to talk in particular about what I just mentioned a moment ago about storm Hercules. Um, we've had seven major storms in four and a half years. I know that because I've been here four and a half years. And while people have said, and people know far better than I do, that the town's always had storms and they've always had impacts, that is true. What has changed is the frequency of them. And as the frequency of that continues, even though we know how to address that and we know recovery and we know mitigation, <coughs> the infrastructure for that is getting taxed at a much more accelerated rate than it would if you just had a 91 storm, a no-name storm. We're having major serious storms in a very constricted period of time. And um, even though we have $8 million we expect to get approved in FEMA money, that requires a 25% cash match. So that's a couple of million the town's going to have to come up with. And, I, and I've thought long and hard about the budget in terms of the fact that we have a, a $70 million budget all in, give or take, with enterprise funds. Um, and we have carved out, as I say here, $2.6 million in revenue for foreshore protection between CPC, generous funding, the operating budget of the town, re real cash like free cash, um, <laughs> and also borrowing to do that. Five, and, and the FY15 budget recommends $500,000 for that again. However, given the 
enormity of these <coughs> storms continuing to impact the infrastructure, um, I've come to the conclusion that we need to look at a different option in terms of a more accelerated pace to begin to address um, the issues around our seawalls and the revetment. And, and that's going to be a challenge for the advisory committee, the capital committee, and the board of selectmen to look at with the myriad of other public building projects we have coming forward. But I believe I would be remiss if I didn't recommend to the board at this time that this needs now to be in the mix. And not that it wasn't in the mix all along, but given this last storm that we had coming on the four storms that we had last year, I think it's time that we ask the community um, how we address this problem. We aren't going to get it there by doing $500,000 a year. We're not going to get there by a million dollar request by a petition article at town meeting that will cut in to the operating budget and our general fund borrowing is very limited to only about 1.2 a year. We're intentionally smoothing that debt so we can only take on so much additional um, debt each year. Um, so there's hard choices, I think, uh, for the boards and committees and what goes forward to the community. But um, So, I Tricia, are you, are you uh, maybe suggesting that we look at it in a different approach, kind of uh, in a, a phasing approach with um, raising funds to, to do this or ask various boards, whether it's the advisory or, um, or us to, to come up with proposals? Or I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you're saying that because I think that's, I think that's an issue that we need to address long term. And I'm not saying you haven't, it's just that I think you're right. Whether we say 500 or a million, it's going to be a bigger problem that we need to address. The problem is we were not putting regular money into any of our infrastructure. That's right. nobody in this room's fault or whatever. So we have water issues, we have sewer issues, we have forest shore protection issues. 2.6 million in four or five years is a lot of money. Right. Eight million dollars with a cash match of 1.6 is a lot of money. But as you know, the FEMA money only does sections of already damaged wall. And we have from the <coughs> inventory, we know that to look at all these and start to do serious work is a much higher number. What I'm saying is it can't be satisfied by the operating budget, and it can't be satisfied by our annual capital plan where we borrow about $1.2 to replace trucks, to do school technology. So we need to look at a different <coughs> paradigm for addressing this issue. Whether and, and, and I say that because I think we need to be aware of it, but I don't think we own that responsibility. We clearly own the responsibility for public seawalls, how they're treated in private areas is another matter, but if something happens to those seawalls, then we need to be part of the process to solve that. It's a state and federal issue as well. We didn't build those seawalls. They were all built, as we know, in the 1920s by the WPA or whatever, but this board and these town officials here now bear the responsibility of the impacts. And um, so I just, I think we just need to be open to saying, how do we step up to this challenge when we have all these other, you know, important needs as well? Um, and that's really for the community to decide. But instead of us wrestling with how much to throw at it every year, um, I think we need to ask the community you know, present it to them and see what they're willing to pay for. Um, and then um, go from there. Because what we're doing has been tremendous, but it's, it's not enough. Gotcha. And, um, I, you know, I've really come to that realization after the last winter we had, and then this storm yet again, and it's only the beginning of January. Um, so it's a concern I have, and I have to share it with you. Um, Moving on, I, uh, there's some things that I concentrated on the FY15 budget. The um, budget is balanced without using free cash in accordance with our policies. We have revised um, the financial <coughs> team along with the financial forecast committee, uh, increased our local receipt, pro local receipt projections by half a million dollars. Um, so that helped this budget tremendously as far as budget development for both the town and school. Local aid, which has really been uh, a roller coaster as far as us being able to know what we're going to get, is actually level funded this year. This is the first time in several years we haven't been carrying a cut in the projections. And um, as of this date, our union contracts are in, in pretty good shape. 
and you can see the town patent there, which is below our 2.5% levy limit, so that keeps it affordable, and that's something that we've been able to do with the cooperation of all our employees, which I'm very happy to say. And as you can see, um, as we look at the available revenue we have to recommend the budget each year, every 1% COLA on the town side is $100,000 and FY14 dollars right now. And it's no surprise that, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> fixed costs account for most of the increases. This next page gives you a, a comparison <coughs> of FY14, uh, what we've appropriated and what I'm recommending, and shows you the percentage variance. Um, you're all very familiar with the discussions about the increases in pension. Health insurance, because of plan design, has remained um, level funded. FICA is employee payroll tax, which is just a function of our total employee census. OPEB, I already mentioned, that's 2% of the retirement assessment goes into our OPEB account. The um, workers' comp is steady. Unemployment's up a little bit based on current history. Our liability insurance um, is level funded. Le uh, general liability insurance was $495,000 in FY11, so we've been able to go out to bid um, and get much more affordable insurance and also increase our lines of coverage by going through Maya. As you can see, nominal change in debt service and um, this year another sort of roller coaster amount is South Shore Regional Voc. We anticipate only three students um, for FY15. We've had as many as 11, 12, 13 and for our assessment. So um, that's a, a positive um, move there. So <coughs> Along with just trying to fund the budget, we also try to do something new. As you know, all the department heads do goals and objectives, and they're measured on their performance in achieving those each year. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we want to continue moving forward with technology and making um, improvements in planning. And um, the specific areas in planning is, I talked to you about the positive trend in building development. Um, the building department needs additional assistance to deal with all that work. We have existing projects and we have anticipated projects with the development of the Goulston property and potentially Greenbush that is not enough for um, our building inspector right now and, and he recognized that. All the departments in the budget this year have done benchmarking so when you review everybody's deb departmental budget you'll be able to see how we compare to staffing and budget and services with comparable communities around us and um, this is one of the the things in terms of the building department that you'll see the benchmarking data really supports um, it expands collaborations with the school department we will sunset the DARE program most likely and we'll have a school resource officer uh, in the um, school department in, in the fall and that's something that Chief Stewart and Superintendent McCarthy have worked very closely on and we are doing collaboratively. The facilities department continues to grow. Um, we hired the facilities director, the school has hired the assistant facilities director. This budget recommends to ha add an additional person who is essentially a handyman carpenter. We are paying Kevin $40 an hour to crawl under places and get bids and he really needs to manage not only the facilities but the oversee and coordinate with the Public Building Commission, the library, the Public Safety Building. He's a member of the School Building Committee. So um, we need some more bandwidth there and able to address these things. And then finally, a focus on economic development. The request from the Economic Development Commission was $97,000. Again, revenue that we weren't allocating to a budget two, three years ago. That budget has been funded at 97,500 in a different way than the, on some, in some different ways than the EDC <coughs> has asked for. Um, but um, it does make major inroads and initiatives into the MAP study that you're gonna, you just heard about earlier being able to actually have those recommendations implemented. And that was the main focus and request of the EDC when I met with the chair, that they have some funds to be able to implement the recommendations that come out of this study. Um, and um, the capital plan also takes that a step further by um, it recommends purchase of a trolley <coughs> to run service between Greenbush and the harbor to get people off the boats to Widow's Walk and the train and vice versa. 
and um, we can talk more about that later in the capital plan but um, that's another initiative in this budget we have 35 departments so that those 35 departments all need to be balanced in terms of your goals departmental goals um, and what we have is available resources and so it's really a matter of balancing the priorities um, but it does continue some of the things we've had still in the override from 2010 there's four hundred thousand dollars in there <coughs> in the operating budget again for foreshore protection and for roads and as I mentioned earlier the total recommendation uh, for foreshore alone is five hundred thousand dollars in FY 15 which um, the petitioners last year articulated at town meeting I think that you know we needed at least five hundred thousand dollars a year um, it provides for the contract settlements uh, we have two settled contracts I anticipate we'll have three soon so the budget numbers that you're going to see will vary when you look at the departmental request versus my recommendation because we were able to roll in the contractual increases and in the personal services line item based on the town patent that you saw in the earlier slide and as I mentioned it recommends um, staffing positions for building coastal administration and facilities um, we have 26 warrant articles and that's down from 40 last year so uh, hopefully it will be a one night town meeting <laughs> and then I just want to talk a little bit about the the capital plan Trisha, um, can I just, yep. ask a, just a quick question about the foreshore <coughs> yep. the, what the thing I'm con a little concerned about is you know I know 500,000 is a lot of money um, but if we've got if we're going to look at getting eight million dollars from FEMA we have to be able to match that how how do we come up with matching funds at 25 percent if we don't have the funds available well um, some of the work is going to be reimbursable and others we're going to have to front the money so we don't so and there's also some additional funds in capital stabilization and the work can all be we can't do eight million dollars at once so we'll fund it over several town meetings okay. um, but one of the things we have to figure out is if the town's going to be expected to front the entire hundred percent and then get reimbursed I've spoken with Kevin about this and he said some will be upfront cash and some will be reimbursable but we can't do it's just like the the water and Marty yeah. we can't do 22 million in one year no, we're I not going to be that. able to do eight million of work so it's going to be over several years and Tricia what's the the staffing for coastal <laughs> administration the coastal administration and it's detailed in the budget mess, um, message is um, it proposes a full-time position uh, for a coastal resources officer 22 percent of that position will be grant funded because FEMA will actually pay us to have someone administer the flood flood the hazard mitigation elevating the houses we already know we have 17 houses this year that need to be elevated um, Laura can't manage that anymore she's been doing a fabulous job the last few years um, the community rating system <coughs> we are trying to get an even higher rating the next time around um, this takes a tremendous amount of time with, for Patrick um, even though he has a tremendous CRS <coughs> committee working with them um, the conservation issues and enforcement offices uh, issues are increasing and as building increases so does conservation commission work so the plan would be to have that person do the flood mitigation grants the community rating system to work on uh, helping administer all this foreshore protection work and to deal with other things we're dealing with like the FEMA appeals now if you're following all the FEMA stuff there's going to be a vote this week in Congress to delay the Bigot Waters Act up to four years that's only pushing it down the road for more years or if it doesn't pass it's going to be here for us for the long term um, what's been happening is that the building department the Conservation Commission office the planning office and myself have devoted ignoring amounts of time where we have to drop everything to do this and it's not conducive to us getting to do the other things we have to do as a normal job um, this was something the board um, um, recognized in one of the retreats I think three years ago and um, I think the time has really come that we need to devote someone to this it's my recommendation um, the money that's available in the budget um, I can recommend in areas that I think the town needs it and so that's that's the area that um, 
I, I, I really think step, we can't continue to do this piecemeal and the FEMA stuff was just the last straw in terms of having to <coughs> immerse yourself in something that's highly technical and I'm going to talk later in my report about the next step in the FEMA appeal process and how that goes. So as I said, some of it's grant funded, so that will help offset the cost. Um, I talked about town meeting and just quickly in closing about the capital plan. We had over almost $71 million in FY15 capital requests. Um, and two, just under $3 million is recommended from the general fund. 1.25 of general fund borrowing, which is in keeping with our policies, and a million of free cash. That still leaves us about $535,000 in free cash, which we need to always keep as a reserve. I don't ever go below $500,000 in free cash because we still have the rest of FY14 to get through. And then we don't know what's going to happen um, through FY15. And that's just another uh, reserve fund that the town has in case anything should happen. Uh, we are going to need to transfer some funds at the special in April to pay for the storm mitigation for Storm Hercules. Police overtime for that period alone was $8,000. Um, and as you know, when you see contractors clearing all those roadways, there's a cost involved in that. Um, and then, um, again, there's important initiatives um, in for the schools. The schools, as I mentioned earlier, are starting to embark on a second phase, second tier phase of school technology over the next several years, so it begins to fund that. And um, relocation of the early childhood center, which is costly. We have some physical plant needs that Kevin has been able to discover now that we have eyes and ears on facilities the capital requests have increased because Kevin has discovered these things in our physical plant that we need to add to. And one of them that needs to be done right away is we have a huge drainage issue problem in the fire department headquarters. And that's going to be very costly to <coughs> fix. And that's something that Kevin worked with <coughs> the chief was able to under, un, undiscover. So um, that's, that's that. And then for FY16, we'll continue to get the pension increase of 8%. For sure protection, OPEB will continue to be with us long after we're all sitting here. Um, we have the public facilities with the Gates um, Middle School project going forth and the school feasibility. And then we're already sitting on $32 million in requests for FY16 on our five-year rolling capital plan. Um, so. This is, this is a good budget, though. It's, um, I think, a, a budget I'm very proud of because it lets us do some things because we finally have some funds that I can allocate to them. I don't think it's um, um, over the top in terms of what it's requesting. The benchmarking will show our staff is lean. But I think, you know, given the fact that we have an opportunity to do some things that have been sitting there for a while, this budget incorporates that. So um, I just wanted to give you an overview. You have 800 pages to read at night before you fall asleep. Um, and it's all detailed much more in the budget message for both capital and the operating budget. And I also just want to thank Nancy Holt, our new finance director, who's still coming to work after doing this budget. Um, she's a very quick learner and turns things around quickly. <coughs> so um, Excuse me. Um, I, I, I really want to thank her. and. Um, you know, this past year we've had lots of new staff, lots of turnover, and it's the budget process has been new for them as well. Um, but um, they've all risen to the occasion. And the first budget you'll see is Jesse, who hasn't done that for you before, and I'm sure you'll be very, very impressed. So um, thank you for that. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Not seeing any, I'd just like to make a comment. Thank you very much for all your hard work, which you do all the time in these past months was no exception that's for sure to make all these deadlines to prepare all this information <coughs> for us I would uh, go by and talk to you long after <coughs> business hours and you were up to your eyeballs and paperwork and Mr. Chairman I really appreciate everything you've done and Nancy I thank you for everything you've done well, thanks Moving on to our <coughs> budgets. We'll start with number 610, the library. Jesse, just give us one second to get sure. there, Tricia. Number 610. 
In the past, Trisha's asked, um, you have a mission statement right in the beginning. If you didn't, if you wouldn't mind just reading that to us, if, yeah, I have a copy of it here. If you don't have it before, before we start. Sure. Um, so our mission is to provide a free, accessible library where acquisitions, programs, and services are patron-driven and to implement service delivery practices to ensure that every patron interaction is positive and efficient. Thank you. Everyone to the budget. I'll open it up to the board if you have any questions. <coughs> We're not, as in the past, we're probably not going to vote them, correct? No. Tricia? We're just going to right. hear them and make adjustments later on if need be. I'll just. Um, looks as I though mean, that. Uh, I was going to say, it looks as though that some of the facilities, um, there were some cuts by the administrator, I presume, because we're going to be looking at a new facility very shortly. And so the need to be able to do some of these things we can negate for the coming fiscal year. Um, and I believe that was the reason for the uh, energy and, and gas cuts, yes. And then, uh, there have been some increases in um, personal services based upon your request and what the town administrator recommended. <coughs> and uh, that's part of the contract negotiations. And uh, um, that's, that's what I noticed, just the difference. Can you go into the personnel side a little bit? Um, certainly. Well, the contracts are being renegotiated right now. We have two unions at the library, AMPS and TOSCA. Um, I believe they're both getting fairly close to um, coming to an agreement on a contract. And uh, so Tricia has actually given me the final number. Um, I base my numbers um, on the current rates that I have with the uh, the contract that's actually expired. Gotcha. Are there any new personnel? Uh, well, we have a new teen librarian, but that's not necessarily a new uh, position. It's just we, that we filled a position that was vacant for a few months. So in your 2015 budget, it's the same personnel as for? Correct. Yes. Same number of staff. Even with? So what year would that go into? Do you need more people when the, new, when the library expands? Uh, we don't believe so. Uh, you know, there were two new positions added, and I believe the 2007 override. And I believe that we have enough staff currently. We're going to have to reshovel. We're going to have to rethink the way we do operations. Uh, but I believe we have enough staff to, to manage the library. <coughs> right. Just strive to do that. Strive to do that. Cause I don't think people are going to be happy to hear well, I, we got a new building and then absolutely say, that's what we're working strive towards. To do absolutely, absolutely. Asked that question when you were, you know, selling us on the project. When you go to a temporary facility, and you know, I mean, <coughs> it's going to be so many moving pieces. It's it's going to be difficult. If we're thirty thousand square feet now, and we go to a 10,000 square foot temporary facility do you still how are you going to manage all you know people are expecting their 32 hours or 20 hours whatever they have how do you any ideas on what you might do on something like that well even though our current facility is 26,000 square feet we really work on about 10 to 13,000 of those square feet we have a few staff that currently reside in the downstairs lower lower level but most of that space is not used by the library. Um, there's the community room space, but then most of it is really not utilized. So, I, I mean, a lot is going to be dependent on what facility we find that we can relocate to. Um, but I feel like if we were able to find a facility that was a 10,000 square foot facility, we would be able to manage with the staff that we have now. All right. When you say fine, though, you're, you're saying basically we're going to have to probably rent something along that lines absolutely and that's budgeted into the into the grant uh, Trish is the major difference in the two personal services the um, the expected uh, rate increase from the contracts 
In personal services, yes. Between yours and, yes. and the departments? Yeah. That's just back. the COLA and STEP increases. Right. For but, 19, Jesse? Yes. Yeah, 19. Right. So you don't have that in your, because the town right, administrator's because, budget right. is, is higher in most of the de department budgets because you've incorporated that. I say rent. I mean, I'm not talking about finding another building in town, something that we're going to have to bring in. That's what I mean by structure. Right, we're exploring a lot of different options right now. Modular units is one possibility. Um, <coughs> we're exploring other potential um, places that we could move to. Um, there really isn't a lot available in town. The MBLC would allow us to move <coughs> outside of the town limits, um, but for obvious reasons, we don't want to move very <coughs> far outside of town limits. So, um, you know. That's another thing that works for. You got some room, don't you, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, along those lines, do we, um, the school uh, that has the modules, are those still being used? And it just, all right, yeah, okay, just sure. thought, I thought about <coughs> today. Okay. I was wondering, the reason why I say it, since we talked about Vermont earlier, I remember a uh, store had uh, right. burnt down up you in Vermont. What they ended up bringing in was literally a bubble for like a year or two before they rebuilt. It was basically a huge igloo. <laughs> ugly as sin, but at least it served its purpose, and I don't know whether or not there's something along that lines, given the size that you're I think, looking for. I think the modulars come in all different shapes and sizes, and something like what you're talking about is an option. Um, the, the issues that we have when we're talking about relocation are um, the state requires that the, whatever facility we move into be ADA accessible. Uh, and also we have it does not the whole facility doesn't necessarily have to meet this requirement but some part of the facility has to be able to handle 150 pounds per square foot which is what it requires to hold the weight of uh, books, books. Yeah. Um, and most typical office spaces are about 60 to 80 pounds per square foot um, I've talked to some modular companies obviously this will all have to go out to bid but just to sort of get my own head around it. I've talked to some companies who have said that they actually build temporary foundations. Um, so, you know, that's a possibility. Um, the, the town does own some of the land around the library. So even remaining on the grounds might be possible. And we have $180,000 budgeted for the actual location. Yeah, you're going to need parking, though. So then they're going to be using the construction site with parking. The reason why I was thinking it was like, like Central Park. If you could put something like on a light, gigantic parking lot with a huge bubble, you wouldn't have to worry about the pounds because you wouldn't need a foundation. You could heat it. It's, like I said, it's going to be ugly as sin, but at least it could serve its purpose if it's something right. local and to Right, and presumably we could run electricity from yeah. the current library and to... And if it's on flush with the ground, then you wouldn't have to worry about ADA compliant other than doorways getting in and out. But but I think you, you're probably thinking operationally too. I mean, maybe, maybe you come up with a, a delivery system for books that's cheaper than renting a facility. You know that you can hand deliver books, or you know who knows what options are. I'm sure you're tossing it all around to figure out what the best way to do it is. Mm. I say you'd be like, what's it? Amazon is going to be yeah, doing it. Robert Crowe's going to drop the book like a stork. We we have said that you know if we just want to get a bunch of bookmobiles and we'll just drive around for a year and a half and or so. Sell time. ice cream along the way. There you go. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks. So just, and just in total, we usually just read off the number. So yes. in um, <coughs> 2014, uh, the <coughs> library budget was nine hundred fifty-six thousand dollars, and uh, this year. <laughs> um, the town administrator's uh, number is nine hundred forty-three thousand dollars. The department, of course, was nine hundred fifty-three, and I think the difference there is just utilities and and um, repairs and stuff that won't happen because of the, the new building. Yeah. There's been a slight reduction in our materials line, and um, we understand and expect that that's going to happen when we're relocating. We're not going to be purchasing as many new items and we'll probably be trying to invest more in electronic resources and things of that nature. Don't you have to buy a certain amount? We do have to buy a certain amount um, and but this we're still going to be in compliance with this amount. Right. So there's several m moving pieces in this budget because in FY15 um, they will be vacating the space and will not be in the same square footage they are now and it's likely they'll be reduced services and hours. <laughs> right. But even despite that we still have to um, fund the budget 
as it is now, will request a waiver from the Library Commission, but that is only as much as 10 percent. What's included in your budget is all the additional costs the town is responsible for that aren't funded under the grant. And um, since we believe that that needs a funding source, we've allocated um, additional funds into the capital outlay of the budget. There's $13,000 and change in that because if the moving costs, if the rental costs are not within the grant budget, um, if the non-eligible costs aren't covered by the delta of the seven million, um, we need to have a provision for that. So we've put seed money in that budget, um, but I do not expect that the budget you see here will be <coughs> fully expended in FY15 unless to Jesse's point, we were able to find 10,000 square feet and keep everybody there and do that. And so this is a budget, um, and for more of you too, that we might need to approve and then tweak again at the fall town meeting once we know, you know, where you're physically going to be um, to move line items or whatever in other places where we need to put money. Okay. Questions, comments? Tony read off the numbers. Challenging year for you guys. Good. Yep. It's going to be. It'll be good. Yeah, going to earn it. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Steve, come on down. You're next. 141 assessors. <coughs> All along, Marty. Oh, All right. All right. <laughs> pretty simple stuff. Good evening. Hi, Steve. How are you? Thanks, what, how are you? Thanks for being patient. If you wouldn't mind reading off the mission Girl. statement. The mission of the assessor's office is to ensure a process of fair and equitable assessments in accordance with <coughs> Massachusetts general law and Department of Revenue guidelines, directives, and policies. Thank you. Last year's appropriation was 86. This year, the town administrators recommended 264 and change. Uh, mm -hmm. Salaries, looks like it's up. Salaries. Mm -hmm. Side amount, not a whole lot. It's a big well, it's. It's the COLA and stuff. Technical services. Technical services. Technical services. Technical services yeah. yeah, is that a typo? No. $70,000? Did you read that? Yeah, it's for the revaluation. And historically, we've funded that through an article, but I, we're going to do it through the budget this time. I guess. Just, you don't need it. I mean, we have to do it every three years. We do a separate Warren article for it. We can just roll it into his budget and fund it that way under the omnibus budget <coughs> save an article. Just on that, n that note, I see in your goals and objectives, um, implement annual process. So after uh, 2015, are you looking to try to do this annually then, Steve? Is that? What's wh that? Um, identify, uh, this was under your objectives, implement annual process, April 2015. Well, so I wasn't sure what, what exactly you meant by that. In other words, is that for evaluating going forward or? On the first goal? On, on your first. Uh, oh, that, that's just that's just the data quality study that we'll do we'll just to be certain that the existing data is accurate, and if we find any errors or any kind of omissions, we can update things. It's not part of a revaluation process. Oh, okay. It's just part of an ongoing thing that we'll do anyways. Okay. I was just looking at some of your goals. I was kind of intrigued by them. That's all. I know we've jumped right to your budget, but I, I thought, you know, you're looking to do some delineation in the neighborhoods. Right based on zoning and try to incorporate into the GIS system well, ultimately so that we go online we can take a look exactly. at a parcel and property in conjunction with zoning or building and, and we, also with assessment we have nine we have nine assessment districts that have been in existence maybe even before 2006 but I recall 2006 being the year when we got a new software um, and there have been some changes to neighborhoods um, I guess the most recent thing you could talk about would be um, storage down to um, Hadley Road and parts of mine it, that may change may change some, some sales activity on numbers. We don't know until we look at it. So we may tweak some lines. Um, the geographical lines right now, but sometimes as we look at sales, we realize that sometimes we have to change the lines, not just necessarily down the street, but across the street or something or in, into another neighborhood. And that's what that, that's all about. Steve, you want to take one second and just explain what the $70,000 is for? Yeah, that's like, like what actually... I mean, I've heard you talk about it, but I think yeah. anyone watching may be interested in, in terms of 
Well, the well, Department of Revenue every third year requires the town to do a revaluation, a recertification update of all values. Um, and the vendor that we choose will have to um, uh, come up with all new land values, new building values. It, um, it's a, it's a labor-intensive process. It involves an a, a analysis that goes on for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, last time we did a, what we call a full field review, which that was, it was more of a field um, process. This will be more analysis, but nevertheless, it still takes quite a long time. Um, and the DOR, again, gives us a number of studies that we have to produce and provide for them and offer them to certify us. So, so it's it not a field, you're not doing the field one this time? Not a full field review. We don't have to this time. Um, How often do you have to do that? Well, they, they, they suggest every third revaluation. Um, and what that means is that you're out at every property, looking at every home. It's not, a, it's not a, a physical inspection of the interior. It's simply looking at the exterior and making sure that the data that exists is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and then making small adjustments based on condition and quality and style and all of those kind of things. So we hire a consultant, and they are the ones that come in and crunch all the data and Correct. get it to the DOR. Correct. I got a question for you, Steve. With a vacant lot where a house might have been on at one time, does that get <coughs> reassessed for the value of just a vacant lot? Yes. No, so the house doesn't get built again? Correct. Uh, um, and, and generally, if it's a buildable parcel, we'll say as a buildable lot, unless something changes with zoning or, right. or something. But um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be a vacant parcel with a buildable value. Or a non-buildable value if it's a non-buildable exactly. lot. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, if something changes. But if it was non-conforming, so a buildable lot, it's a buildable <coughs> lot. Uh, and the reason why I'm thinking of it is I'm thinking about a lawsuit that was <laughs> the town's involved in, and it just kind of struck me of thinking, okay, if the lot's not conforming, doesn't get rebuilt, it's abandoned for a number of years, and the person doesn't pay tax on it, but they pay it only at a reduced rate, I would assume, because they're not building, paying it on. Usually. I mean, you know, we, uh, it usually works the other way. We have parcels that we have what we call a 132 class code, which is unbuildable. And I won't say the subdivision is there today, but there are, there are changes that happen. So um, we you know, never say never. Um, it could go either way. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Just going to comment on, you know, everybody does their own different benchmarks, you know, and they look at it different ways. <coughs> Yours was interesting in terms of number of parcels, number of man hours that we have in the department, and compare that to the surrounding communities. And, um, you know, we're right in line or below what our surrounding communities. It's, it's tough to find one that has, you know, kind of in a new, unique well, slot with 9,000 plus. I, I didn't include some of the criteria that we, that we look at as assessors. Um, we don't have a large commercial commercial base as we know. But um, for example, the town of Rockland, I think, has five different land values townwide from say 120 to 160. We have upwards of 30 land value categories um, because of the water. So we have, you know, West End has certain land values and you get towards the water, land values differ. We have water view, we have water orientation, we have direct waterfront, we have all you those kind we of have things. 30 different values? Yeah. 30. A lot. Yeah. We have to. We have yeah. to. Right. No, that's, that's so within neighborhoods, fair. within a neighborhood, for example, you could, in a neighborhood on the cliff, for example, we could have eight different land values in one neighborhood. In waterfront, water view, um, uh, there's a number. There's a, there's a number right. of different categories. Remember, you gave us that thing. Oh, I've sh actually, we've had a conversation about that. Well, I, you I gave us a piece of paper <coughs> last time that listed all of. Oh, that one. But I think you and I had a conversation about the, the land values one time, and I showed you the different um, categories. <laughs> <laughs> you guys Thank do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank just you the, like the, the totality of numbers, yeah, are um, last year was 186, 971, mm -hmm. and this year's 264, which is a little misleading because of the $70,000 revaluation number. Exactly. In there. And it does obviously make sense to put it in there. It is. It's going to happen every three years, so. It has to. We don't, we don't have any, any, I mean, any you, choice. Tricia, could you accrue for it to flatten it out? The rebel? Yeah, you could appropriate 30000 Each you know. year. I did that in another town. We just, you know, did a special Sorry. article, 25, because the special article is forever. So you just appropriate 25000 But could it be year. in the budget? Um, no, I don't, no. It would, no. he should have It would clean out, out every year, yeah. So. Mm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. And this is going to be funded mostly with overlay reserve, so um, only a small portion of the town's revenues, because it's really arguable whether the town should be. Overlay reserve? What's that? 
the over overlay, overlay surplus. 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 Uh, we, we raised, let's say, two hundred thousand, two fifty gotcha. overlay, and then it's the yep. it's, yeah. right. So okay. we're, this isn't funded through. Ten thousand of it, Nancy. Ten thousand of it's funded on the town revenue side. But the rest, our financial policies call for a five-year rolling average to release from the overlay reserve. And this makes sense because um, it's funding for the reval. And, and we're fortunate we don't have any big cases that we foresee in the near future. Um, right. you know, well, we've never done that before. Right, not, the, not funded it from the overlay reserve. No, surface. we haven't. We haven't. I mean, there's a, an argument to be made that this is really a fixed cost as opposed to a town side responsibility. It's a law. We have to do it every three years. Um, so that's why we finally decided to roll it into the budget. And, and that's been consistent. This is the third, third time it's been that kind of, it hasn't changed that much as far as increasing. The dollar amount. Yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. 70, it was 72 last 11. and 70. 75, I think we did. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. been about the same. But what, um, Will you be able to fund it every three years from that, do you think? Or is this a one-time? It depends on what the five-year rolling average is. As Steve just said, we haven't, it's, the overlay reserve surplus is what's <coughs> left after all the abatements and exemptions for people who seek abatements or go to the appellate tax board are. Um, so the reason you do the five-year rolling average is because it recognizes you have aberrations in years where you're going to have higher or lower. The, we have the money now because we haven't done a reval in three years, so it's all settled. FY16, you're going to have a higher reserve because more people get a new tax bill based on the reval and apply for more abatements. It just, it just perks yeah. people's interest once they know a revaluation is occurring or anything else that may happen with the market. Um, so, and, and we haven't had any big appellate tax board cases lately, but one thing that does concern me is that the Catholic Church filed last year again, and they appealed their, their, their denial once again. That's still on appeal, right? No, no, we, we, we had the case and we were successful. But in, 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 in 13, they, in 12, they didn't, didn't file. They came back and filed last year. So that's up at the appellate tax, but we haven't had a hearing date uh, assigned or anything, but we're not certain what their, their, what their motive is or their approach is. I mean, it was determined they were not exempt, but yet they, they chose to file again after, after not filing for one year. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, I mean, we, we expect we'll be successful again, but yeah. if we're not, then there's forty or $50,000 we're looking at right. out of the overlay. Thank you. We just hope they'll do it again in another like three years when we have to have another seventy thousand dollars. <laughs> oh, no. It's the archdiocese to pay for. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank Thanks, you. Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. One sixty one, town clerk. <coughs> hey Kath, how are you? I'm good. good. Thank you. Okay. Reading your mission statement. Mission please. statement, okay. The mission of the Office of the Town Clerk is to serve as the official record keeper and archivist of town <coughs> records and God statistics. God bless you. To coordinate and oversee elections and voter registration in compliance with Massachusetts and local law and to assure sound documentation and access to local government for the general public and town government. To accurately establish, maintain, and certify all vital statistics of the town and to collect and administer licenses, registrations, and permits required by Mass General Law and town bylaws. To provide courteous, competent, and efficient service to the community in an effort to establish public confidence and respect for government. Thank you. You're welcome. Looks like about a just under thirty thousand dollar increase. And maybe some part time salaries is up about ten thousand. Yeah, the support services are uh, up a lot. Right. Okay. Kathy, what is that, the support services, is it software? Uh, no, support services mostly uh, having relating to town meetings and elections. Okay. In other words, you've got ballot programming, um, all the election costs, food, custodial. You've got your sound systems for a town meeting, um, and you've multiplied that times however many town meetings <coughs> I budget in a year. I've got a couple of specials in the annual. 
um, budgeted in there. And um, the programming of the ballots. So you multiply that times, we have the state primary in the fall, the state election in the fall, and the annual of 2015. Um, you've got three elections in, I think it's three town meetings. But There's an extra there. election in there too, which yeah. is driving the, it's yes, that's the, the other thing, yes. middle school override. Oh, yes. that's right. So we have, that's okay. what's, that's, what is it, 6000 I think that's all It's um, $8,400 $8, more. 8400 for mm -hmm. an extra for, election. For, okay, so that's the that's, difference. That's mm -hmm. the difference. No, no, but it was 18. It's a 32. So 18 only had two elections, right, in 2014? I'm sorry, in 2000 <coughs> 2014, we budgeted 18000 Right. So that must have been two elections? Tell we had. Yes. Two town meetings, an annual and a special. And two, yes, but we also, yes, and then we went to special elections. Then we had those two special elections, yes. Which were partially, well. Which, right. What was $5,600, I think, we got back from the um, government. So there goes in the general fund. Right. The right. Well, I guess we're just, you know, it's jumping from 20 to 18 to 32. Where are you looking? I'm looking at. Just under 13 to 14. Oh, here we are. It's under support services? Is that what you're looking yes. at? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. In 2014, yes, we had, gosh, how many elections do we have? We had so many. I, I lost count. It's, I think it's the extra special election that's bringing that up. Because you figure programming, programming of ballots is $2,000. Printing the ballots is roughly $2,000, give or take $100 or $200. So that's... $4,000 right there. Yeah, per election right. alone. And then you figure another... The labor. <coughs> that, and then, well, that, that's personnel services. Right, that's okay, that's right, different. Right, yeah, okay, that's, right. that's something different. But then you have your police detail, your custodial fees, and the food to, to feed the election workers. So those costs, I think, off the top of my head, they run. It's basically eighty-four to nine thousand dollars an election, for if you if you're adding in. Well, no, that adds in personal services too. So let's get that. But yeah, so it's it's a lot. It's four thousand dollars just for the ballots, programming and printing. So the thirty-two here is four elections. Is that what you have for fifteen? If it's eight thousand dollars each, I have four. No, don't cut because that's eight thousand includes personnel. So you have a fall special town meeting next year. You have a state primary in November fourth. You have a state election. You have the May town election in two thousand and fifteen, and an annual town meeting in two thousand fifteen. And I've also the special election for the schools if that happens. That's been figured. Fall in. of two thousand fifteen. No, well, that'll that be the next year. Be yeah. June. All right. Oh, so all right. Well, so the election will be after right. the fiscal year. Right. The, we're hoping the town meeting will be 14, but the election's probably going to be in FY15. Couldn't you do it in May? The school isn't even getting the recommendation from MSBA until May. <coughs> and then they need time to educate the folks about the ballot question. And we have to have a town meeting. So is it possible that we could, well... I was going to say so, a fall so Kathy's election. So Kathy's original request was twenty-five-six for all the costs she mentioned: um, <coughs> conversion data, election machine maintenance, custodial meals, programming the machines, um, and then we just I added the additional amount to thirty-two thousand for the extra election. Okay. In the previous request, the, the also that's Trisha just reminded me. It costs about two thousand dollars a year to maintain the older machines that we have. We have a service contract with a, a company out in Illinois, ESNS. And they come out, um, I believe it's usually in October, and it's about $1,900 right now to service those machines. And they test them and what have you, so. CPS 2013 was actually more than that. Just one thing, I, I know with our um, grand plan or strategic plan, um, obviously so that looking for space is a paramount for you to make sure that the clerk's office has adequate oh, absolutely. storage space, because that's mm -hmm. one of the Vault. These obstacles that you have, mm -hmm. right? Vault okay. space for the archives and also storage space for the election equipment because that has to be logged. So, and that right now is being kept in the shed 
um, the machines are being kept in a shed down in the basement and the, the booths and the um, bins are in the garage. So, yeah, that's, that's paramount to safe, you know, climate controlled storage for the archive records is important. Any other questions or comments? No. Yeah, it looks like you're, did you go through the uh, FY14 appropriation? Don't you go through that? No, or? I didn't. You want to do so it? So the uh, number for fiscal year 14, which ends June 30th, for this this fiscal year that we're currently in, was $165,450. And the amount that's being recommended by a town administrator, uh, which I assume, Kathleen, you're in agreement with, is for $193,318. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Kathy, thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much, gentlemen. 241 inspections. Hi, Neil. Hi. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Good. Good. Ready? Please. Ready? Uh, mission statement of the Inspections Department. Uh, the mission of the Citroen Inspections Department is to ensure the public safety, health, and welfare as it relates to buildings and structures by conscientious enforcement of the State Building Code, Gas and Plumbing Code, Electrical Code, Weights and Measures Regulations, State Disabilities Regulations, and FEMA Floodplain Regulations. In addition, the Inspections Department is charged with enforcing the Town of Situate Zoning Bylaw and applicable general bylaws. Thank you. The budget looks to be up about seventy some thousand dollars in total, 229 to 301. Town administrator is recommending. And that has how many new positions? Yes. Have new positions right. the new Two? Uh, well, one and a half? It, it, one, one and a half, yeah. Yeah, it, well, it's really it's one new uh, local building inspector and then um, a, a 10 hour clerk. Uh, we're just been overwhelmed with paperwork and. Um, yes, you have. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's not just FEMA. You know, FEMA alone uh, has been kind of overwhelmed us. But if I could just a uh, little point of interest uh, at a uh, development review team meeting today, I went down and I added up all of the um, projects that are either under construction or will most likely be ready for permitting in the spring. And I came up with a figure of around 170. Um, that does not include Toll Brothers' uh, proposal for 97 units. So, in the near future, we could have you know 300 uh, new units in this town, which is just uh, I mean it's just accumulated you know over the years. You know, starting with the recession, and a lot of projects were permitted, and uh, several. Chapter 40B projects, which are quite large, and they're just, you know, with the improving economy, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're underway. So. Much like what Tricia said just yeah. a while ago. If she made the case, anyway, so I don't have to add much. <laughs> so explain the $72,000 increase. What, what are those? That's a full-time position. Full-time, uh, well, I think um, basically when when we put uh, when we do our budget we put in what we did last year because we don't you know know the, but the coal is going to be um, so the 70,000 would in, it, include you know, the cola, cola okay. would include the 10-hour part-time clerk would include the 35-hour local building inspector so that's the uh, build local buildings inspectors at 41,000 per annum <coughs> and the extra clerk at 10 hours a week is 9,000 which I thought I cut but <laughs> <laughs> and then the 22 is cola yeah steps and and whatever yeah. well, that seems high I, wait wait a minute the local's 57 put in 57 i think for the local i'm sorry i stand corrected i was reading the wrong line item yeah. So it's in there at 56. Yeah, yeah. 56. Yeah. 56. Yeah. 57 and change. 56603, Tony. I'm See, sorry. Yeah, I, I should have I seen was it. reading um, another salary. Yeah. 
Well, well, one thing I have to say, Neil, is when I'm looking at the inspections and the benchmarks to the surrounding communities, we're getting a lot of bang for the proverbial buck. I mean, there's only one other community that does more inspections, and that's Hingham, actually Marshfield and Hingham. Um, your permits for permits was 833 with a budget of about almost $230,000. Um, I was I was amazed um, by comparison to all surrounding communities. That's well done, well below. You know the budget for Hingham is over seven, almost seven hundred thousand dollars, and they only have a hundred thousand. They only have like about a hundred well, more just, permits. Just to clarify that, they they actually have uh, combined with planning, so some of that is is planning. But I would like to point out of of all the communities, Situate, uh, Marshfield may be close, but Situate has the most work on the on the coast. We absolutely do, and, and especially after storms, going back yeah. in to making yeah. sure the work's done. This yeah. is and just Hull, Hull has a lot of that also, yeah. but. They both have two full-time building inspectors and have had that for quite some time. I think time. that's what people need to know. It's not like somebody's saying, I'm building a new house or I'm just going to renovate, and you go out and do inspections. It's also right. the inspections after storms. You've yeah. got to go back in to make sure that the electrical's there, that everything's fine, you know, whether yes, it's absolutely. piping, plumbing, electrical, you know, structural, as you know, so, so people understand there's a lot of work. So, so this inspector will just go out and do the inspections, which you do now, and do you hire somebody to do that? We, we actually, uh, we have a, a myriad of duties that need to be done. You know, plan review, uh, building inspections, uh, zoning enforcement, zoning investigation, court appearances. I, I mean, these things we just have not had time to do. Um, where, where, you know, primarily public safety, and that's what we concentrate on. And, you know, we, we need to, I mean, take our zoning enforcement seriously. and. And uh, you know, there's, we have quite a backlog, and, and and it just doesn't get better as time goes on. I've mentioned in the past in my um, report that the other thing, keep in mind, the, the regulations uh, over the past ten years have just multiplied and multiplied. And you know, we're 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 uh, with the energy conservation. We're we're a stretch code community. Uh, we're in the 110 mile power wind zones. Just so much more paperwork, and so much more to review, and so much to look at when you go out on the jobs. And um, you know, the, the 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 position has really. And, and then with this, you know, several hundred units coming online, um, it, it really is something we need if we want to do the job properly. So the other thing too, if I may, is part of this is um, succession planning. Um, Neil, can you tell the board what a building commissioner needs for licenses now? What a, um, yeah, the, um, for the building inspector, yeah. yeah. For an building um, inspector. There's, there's basically a, uh, it, you need to, first of all, um, in, in order to be, to get certified, they've changed the regs. You actually have to be hired um, if you're going to get certified. Uh, so you, we'd be looking for an, building inspector that was already certified. So in order to get there, uh, they need at least five years experience or, you know, uh, college degree, uh, engineering, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's a, a series of tests. There's, uh, I think, three uh, tests. There's a lot of studying, a lot of, you know, there's, I've taken the test. You go in, there's nine books you, you bring with you and um, covering things such as fire protection and uh, the state building code itself, uh, American with Disabilities Act, those, those sort of things. So there's a series of three tests to become a local inspector. And then uh, to become a building commissioner is a series of six tests to receive a certification. But any people who take it, typically they'll have a lot of experience, you know, in that field also. And, uh, yeah, they, they've really raised the bar uh, for this position. Which is a good thing, and, and yeah. but it, to go through it's a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And what do you think we can get this person for? What would be per diem? Or I don't understand. I think I think we're looking at uh, you know the starting salary was f somewhere fifty six thousand or so. Um, and you think we could get a person with all these credentials? We'll find out. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Isn't <laughs> yeah. It? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned earlier about a handyman for, yeah. four, you know, someone said, four, you know, you said $40 yeah. an hour. It sounds like a lot, but it might not be if you yeah. want um, yeah, some type of licenses, you know. But, any other questions or comments? No. 
Okay. Um, just to go through the um, bottom line, bottom line uh, the fiscal year yeah. 14, 2014, uh, the appropriation was for $229,000. Uh, $359, and the uh, town administrators recommended $301,383,000. Um, I presume, Neil, you have no disagreement with the town administrator's request. Nope. She's increased based no on from what you were requesting. So um, those are the numbers. Great. Thank you. All right. I think you're up next, Neil. Yes, right? Let's, next. Board. Right, let's get to the zoning board. I don't see a There's a hat. I see one. Sarah wanted to be here, um, and she really is, you know, very good about coming to meetings and everything. She has a very bad cold, so we gave her the night off. Well, she can't say that because I saw her today. She did not tell me that. She didn't look like she had a cold, Neil. So I'm going to tell her that she's on TV. She's going to know that. I think she had something else, watching. Neil. I think she's setting you up. You got your part time. Unless they just added 10. I think All right. they'll struggle through it, okay? Yeah. Right. So the mission statement of the Zoning Board of Appeals um, is the mission of the Citrus Zoning Board of Appeals to interpret <coughs> and apply the zoning bylaws and related Massachusetts statutes to each application before us in a fair and impartial manner and to con conduct its hearings and meetings in a prompt and professional <coughs> manner, extending to each member of the public who appears before it a degree of professionalism and courtesy that will reflect positively on the town. Thank you. We're looking to go from 26-7 to 28-7. All right. I have one question. Okay. And I don't Shoot. know if it goes to Neil or to the town administrator. In this budget, does it include at least a minimum of four books on land use, which is the treaties that the board should be using? Three. Robowski. Okay. So three books. It's three. Perfect. For the a three member board. Member. Or three, three member. I got you. It makes sense. Okay. I mean, we have one in the office. Five. She got three. No, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. We have one in the office, which is up to date. Okay. So, you know, somebody... Uh, you, that's all I, I just yep. think that some of the members on yep. the board should review that's them the so they have an idea. Um, Is that, Is that on yeah, the professional dues? Yeah, just more the services. Okay. Okay. I think so, yes. Okay. Good. That's all I asked. I just want to make sure we, they'd have that. They should. So, so Neil, just uh, Nicole does 19 hours and then she does 16, 16 for somewhere. building, 19 for uh, zoning. So that's just okay. She's, She's paid out of those budgets, but it varies, obviously. Some weeks it's all zoning, and other weeks it's... Oh, do you actually allocate hour by hour? Yeah. N no, it, it varies. Oh, yeah. Okay. Job? Like both jobs. All right. So the FYE uh, 14 appropriation was for $26,712, and what uh, has been requested and agreed upon uh, is $28,757. Yep. All right. Good. All right. Neil, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Neil. Neil. Okay, have a good night. Uh, number 61, Widow's Walk. Bob, I went golfing on Saturday. I couldn't go anywhere. There are a whole bunch of sledders there. <laughs> I'm sure it was a nice day to be out there. It was cold, let me tell you. <laughs> Shall I start with the mission statement? Sure. While we're getting there, it's in the back, guys. John. 661? Yes, that's correct. Widows Walk Golf Course endeavors to offer the best value golf uh, experience on the South Shore by providing a well-manicured championship layout with friendly customer service. Situate residents are granted special policies and pricing to encourage a high level of activity from our, our community members. Is the intent of this in, uh, enterprise operation to offset all expenses through the collection of reasonable usage fees? Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot. From <coughs> one three to one three, about ten thousand dollars. But look at it quickly. So just looking at Bob, just looking at the pricing, you feel comfortable with the pricing? It looks like we're right, right in the thick of it with everybody else. You know? Yeah, I don't think we've got, we really have room for any kind of price increase. I think if maybe the numbers are coming in bad, the only place I would even consider it would, um, would be possibly membership dues. I think we're kind of light in comparison in that part of the, the, uh, you know, the, the area. But, but the um, same the same plans we have now. What is it? 
same plan. Eight hundred bucks or whatever it is. That's well, that's one of them. That's yeah. well, there's yeah. the, the seniors, right? Uh, which is the bulk of our activity, right? Bob, you uh, were rounds down this year. They are okay. You know, weather competition. It's it's everywhere. Okay. It's um not it's not it. just us. Um, certainly, we had tremendous weather the prior year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, we, you keep getting reminded on what a weather-driven industry it is because Widow's Walk, I think, was in the best playing condition um, start to finish this year that it's ever been in. And I thought we had pretty normal weather. Okay. Um, as I say, we had particularly good weather uh, the year that we made the profits and, and really added to our retained earnings. But... Um, it's it's really um, it's a tough industry right now. I think right. that um, the building craze. Um, we simply have too many golf courses now, and when we built, there was nowhere near enough to, to uh, meet demand at that time. So um, we're really in a position where uh, some courses need to go under and stay under. Uh, I think to get back into a healthy supply and demand situation. Number of golf is, is you think has leveled off? That it dropped. Um, well, certainly there's been a decrease, um, you know, in the last, you know, over a 10 year period, certainly um, it is trending downward. Um, so it's probably getting to the point where it's starting to level off now, but certainly um, 10 years ago, there were more golfers than there are today. And something I never took advantage of, but I did hear it in some of the regulars. What was that pass that you offered or, uh, you know, monthly? The player's pass? Yeah. Was that something we phased out this year? No. Uh, no, it's, in fact. It, did, did you change it at all? No. All right. No, in fact, um, we're trying to, ch that's one of the things that I'm trying to make, uh, proposing to make a change to is, um, in allowing for a little bit more sharing of that. Um, it was only to be shared with, uh, the purchaser and a spouse or uh, another family member. Okay. And I'd like to encourage more of the, you know, we, we, we sell that in 10 round purchases, so it's basically a prepaid green fee with discounts okay. according to the amount of um, commitment you make. So we, we sell a 10 round pass, a 25 round pass, and a 50 round pass. Um, we are I'm proposing that we, we um, offer more sharing in the 25 and 50 passes. Like I could loan, lend it to Tony or John or Marty or something? You could come out and you could pay for foursome, let's <coughs> just say, if you want to do that. Oh, yours. foursomes? And yeah, it would instead be. Instead of doing, I see what you're saying. So it you wouldn't be more than, you know, you couldn't use it f to pay for eight people on a given day. No, but you could get a couple. I, that's a good idea. Something to try to encourage um, more purchases of it. And certainly there's, um, you know, uh, there's a much bigger um, percentage discount when you get up into the 50 play. Okay. So, I, you know, that's just a little something that um, I think is worth a try. I'd, I'd like to hear you thinking about those things. That's, that's great, you know, anything to stimulate, to, to regain some of those rounds. So well, I'm trying to get creative with, with um, I don't really like the third party processor um, you know the Groupon type of thing because you lose too much money yeah, I agree. Maybe that's what you, I you get talking. such a small piece of the the pie you know you end up with about a quarter of the going rate which um, is that something we've done away with yeah, we did well that. we did that one time right and we did it in the early stages and you know to be honest with you um, we were real early on the Groupon and of course now there are a lot of copycats oh. It turned out that, um, you know, we thought it would be worth that kind of discount to introduce somebody to the golf course and hope for the return visits. Um, we kind of found that um, Just the majority of those people were, one time. yeah, they're, they were kind of discount only people and um, we, I didn't think that the uh, return visit okay. percentage was very good. You wouldn't know. What about making it any more friendly? Have, have you You've gone as far as you want to go. I know when I go with Tony, he loses a lot of golf balls, so he's, you know, I'm always having to give them to him, so, yeah. You know. Appreciate that. Um, the, well, I don't, I don't know in what the beginning, more. that was a topic, I know. But it, it's always going to be a very difficult golf course. And it's, because um, we really don't have the yardage. There's not much, I mean, between environmental 
uh, you know, constraints, and it's just um, it's just going to be difficult. They've thinned out as much as they can. We've had a lot of positive feedback that it's a lot more friendly now than it was when it, when it opened, but it's it's always going to be a difficult golf course. Do you know what I have to tell you? Because I've never played a good round there. No, you haven't. I'm the one that actually hits the back balls. <laughs> but I have to tell you, because I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it's too difficult to play, and so sure, they probably go somewhere else. I keep wanting to go back there, because I'm driven to beat that course one day. <laughs> and, you know, there's certain holes that I think I should be able to put the ball and do a great job, and I've never done it the numerous times I've played. So that drives me to go back and play. Plus, the course is in great shape, always has been. And um, I noticed you've done some cutting and some clearing to try to augment and improve some of the views at various places, which I think is a really smart thing to do. But um, anyway, one thing I was going to point out is is the number that you know we're talking about the uh, debt service, and that's going to finish is it in FY 17. 17. 17. So when we're planning for FY, or the board's planning for FY 18, right now that debt service for last year was three hundred eighty-one thousand dollars. So if you were to Plan three years from now, we're going to have a, a surplus of presumably over three hundred and eighty thousand dollars. So um, that's coming really close. So it's a huge profit. The reason why I say that is because you're making comments about how you know it's a tough time right now. It's true because we're, we're servicing this final debt for the final two years, but there are a lot of golf courses that aren't going to be in the financial position we're in, and uh, it's a great benefit. I don't know about this trolley. I don't know if you heard the trolley. I don't know what that's going to be, but kind of yeah, intriguing. Yeah. And I have to also say the other thing I, I, I keep saying this every year, if we should start thinking about is there going to be a different clubhouse or doing something, you know, to uh, improve the clubhouse as it stands. You and I have talked about it sure. before events, and I'm like, I think we need to start thinking about it. Whether or not we're going to spend money is another issue, but at least we should plan it and think about it. Um, yeah. It certainly is one of the goals to start really working and looking at that closely <coughs> now that we're getting this close and and come up with a plan and see, you know, are, are we going to be open to borrowing some money? Are we going to have to wait until we uh, get enough retained earnings to pay cash for it? I don't know. That's all stuff that, I, that needs to be discussed with um, Tricia and uh, the facilities manager. But it looks good. And like I said, it looks like we're getting on the cusp of being able to have that discussion and dialogue, which is actually at a good position to be, as opposed to saying, we're in deficits, what are we doing? Let's tear it down, let's do this. But we hear a lot that obviously now, coming to the end, it's, it's going to be a major enterprise revenue generator. I don't think we'll know until whatever is done is done, whether it be a, a massive um, um, reconstruction or just to pretty the place up. But I, right. but I think the curb appeal from day one has hurt us drastically and, and the phys physical structure as well. So even with minor improvements of paving the, uh, you know, impro improving the entrance and, and, and paving the parking lot and some, some little things to the clubhouse, even with that, I think we're going to see, um, a, you know, some very positive effects uh, financially. So. Um, it's hard to just say until we see it, but I, I'm very convinced that that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Just a, a couple of questions. The, uh, the <coughs> fiscal year 14 budget has a revenue of 129125. Where, where are we trending there? That's, that seems high. Are we going to hit that number? Or are we, like, how are we looking for this fiscal year? Well, this, this fiscal year is trending very similar to the previous fiscal year. 13, um, so we're going to be around the 1.23? 1, 1 uh, part of this is I'm going to try to get a little bit more aggressive with filling this golf course without being foolish about it. Um, I think that to go and, and really discount, it cheapens the facility, it cheapens the membership, and so on. But um, I'm already in the works with one vendor, um, which is called Play More Golf. Um, you know, it's, it's one of these where they sell cards and drive business to you. And yes, it's a discounted rate, but it's nowhere near the kind of discounting that you end up suffering with a Groupon type of, uh, um, you know. So what do we think we're aimed for for 14, the 2013 numbers? Hopefully a little bit more because I'm hoping that um, some of these, some of these programs are going to go into effect for the second half of um, 
this fiscal year. So I'm hoping certainly it's going to be an improvement. Hopefully we can get a little bit earlier um, opening to the season than we did last year. And the retained earnings, what, do, we, do we know what those are now? 3,400. 34. Oh, that's it right there. Yep. Of course, then we just um, buy a. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 31,000. And we bought the, the multiplex, I mean the triplex. Right. Yep. So it's going to be a tough to break even in 14 bus. It'll be a, we need well, a good spring. It depends on what his budget's approved at. I no, no, for 14. Yeah. Yeah, for 14. Well, we'll see. A couple real positive things. You know, I, I notice in the summer a lot of kids go there and play, and I think you get that because you have good little programs for that. So I, I encourage you to keep that up and do whatever discounts you can, can to get those because those are the players that are going to continue to play. And, um, the, um, the golf course, as John said, is in really great shape. Um, I was wondering, is the, we were talking about later the contract for the new company. Mm -hmm. are, are, do you have any plans for them to, I know a couple of years ago you, you took certain holes and you really tried to clear it out and make a few holes easier to play. Is any of that built into the contract? I think it's, it's the same contract that's been in, you know, out there yeah. from day one pretty much. So how would you implement something like uh, this 17th hole, you know, somehow opening it up so that it was easier to play or something you know is that part of that or that would be a whole separate it all depends separate. on how much it would entail certainly it would um, uh, you know they do a lot of that with their dime but if it gets to be a major uh, project then that that would be so the they counts. can do some of that stuff in terms yeah, that of that was in their proposal actually to be oh. to look at different ways and yeah because I know we had a meeting years ago where we said you know and you did a lot of it on certain holes where it was just very very difficult for the average guy to to get there to try and make it a little easier for them. Um, as soon as there's a little bit of money. You're looking at me, everybody. <laughs> I'm just staring at well, me. John's not even guy. near that. I just need a crossbow. Give me a crossbow up there and I'll tie a string to it and it's gone. That's it. What's that, Tory Lane? But what's it? Um, and the, and <laughs> the <windmill. laughs> So I, I do think all the programs that you do for the kids are great. I, you support the high school team, which, which giving them the ability to play there and um, and supporting them with discounts. I think the golf course does a lot of really good things for the community. So I really uh, you know, encourage and appreciate all that that you do. Thanks. One thing I was just going to ask. Or, or I, don't I just know. have a quick question. I, I mean, obviously, this is my first one I've done. But I'm looking at the restaurant lease income, and it's all over the place from 09. It's up and down, up and down. What, what is the reason for that? We redid it. No, no, but I mean, you start with 33, you go to 37, 48, back down to 42, down to 35, 7, then you're up to 46, 4. You know what I mean? What is the right here? Look at rent, the lease. Mm -hmm. right yeah. I mean, I'm just wondering why it's all over. I, I think that I think that uh, there might have been a posting uh, thing. I, I I talked to you about that, Nancy. I don't know if you had a chance right to look at it. It hasn't changed that much. The contract was, I think, renewed a year. No, but you see what I mean? No, it's you. Yeah. You drop seven. And then you're back up. Uh, I mean, it's 11. not contingent. There's no sales contingency or anything like that. I think yeah. it's just a flat fee for rent. It is, I and I don't know if if they were late posting. Oh, like timing. June. Yeah, that's that's the only mm. thing uh, that I. I'd, um, but it, I mean, it happens a maybe couple different times. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna have Nancy take a look at that and just see, but because um, it, it didn't make sense. Uh, right. When I was preparing yeah, the budget, the I did, um, I, you know, I, I did have some concern about that. Okay. But I think it's I think it's going to turn out to be posting because in um, I think it was overstated in in thirteen was it? Let's see. No, that's the under one. Yeah, big time. Uh, Twelve was it? Let's see. Twelve was forty two. Yeah, that was overstated. Eleven was forty eight. I almost. I, what about <coughs> eleven though? Forty almost almost forty nine. Forty-eight seven two five. I think that's what the contract was. The bid we had, the, he came in for rebid recently, like two years ago or something, mm -hmm. and it, I, I thought initially his his contract was on a gradual, but maybe it was always a flat fee. But the bid came back and and he ended up bidding high, in order to retain it. But I I, I don't recall the specifics, Mark. I think twelve was overstated and thirteen was understated and. Well, let's go, but we can yeah. go back and look at them. When I look at okay. this, 13 looks wrong to me. Quick question I had for you, Bob, was oh, I know cool. that um, the golf course at, at some point gets officially shut down due to the snow or the weather. Is there any way that maybe in conjunction with the, um, the company, the um, IGM, IGM, 
that they could uh, put signage or something, you know, where people could say, okay, you're now free to walk the golf course so that they'll take their dogs and they run it. The other thing I was thinking is, so at least people have notice and when not to, when you're going to say, okay, golf is now yeah, going back into play. Uh, so a notice Kennedy. requirement. The other thing was, is there any way that they could take a look at the various neighborhoods like Tory Lane and some of the ones on Stockbridge to see if they have some access that they can go on the golf course from those streets? You know, like instead of having to go all the way around and drive there, maybe they can get access to the golf course when it's officially shut down. We'll have to probably put fencing up, but in other words, to open up the fence and then people know. At Tories Lane. At Tories Lane, you can? Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering about some of the other areas, if there's any way of That's seeing if it's a possibility. That's probably the only real. What about the condos by uh, five or six over there? You'd have yeah, to go through they private They don't, they, uh, they don't, they wouldn't they don't have there. access over there. No, I wasn't sure off of Stockbridge if there was a street that. Beer Slain or any of the uh, other ones is a possibility. I don't, I don't think know. that's an easy way over. No, yeah. okay. Yeah. I think the only real easy one, and we've blocked off that gate at Tory's Lane okay. um, with, a, with a boulder, but, I mean, certainly you could get there. I, I don't, I think there's a little parking area at the end of that road. I don't know whether the Tory's Lane people would, would want that activity or not. Um, I'm only saying it's, a, pu it's a public, that. you know, people are using it literally like a park. I was, I was shocked yeah. to see how many people were there over the weekend, which is great to think that we have a, something that's great that we can use during the summer and the spring and the fall for golf and then during the off season people use it for other recreational purposes it's as far as the signage we did do the sign I mean I, I I tape it on my message when dog walking starts I put it on the internet uh, okay. on our site when dog walking starts and ends okay. and um, we did put the signs up in advance um, and to be honest with you when we get into a daily weather permitting basis and the course is not supposed to be open to to dog walking, um, if they know the course is closed, they just ignore it. Gotcha. Just thoughts. Okay. Right. Do we read off the numbers, the bottom line numbers? One, three, eleven. Sure. Four, Fiscal two. year fourteen, the appropriation is one million three hundred eleven thousand two hundred and fourteen dollars, and this year the uh, recommendation was for one million three hundred one thousand five hundred and seventy dollars. Thanks, John. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Bob, thank you again. I think the last one, well, this is 135, the finance director, town accountant, Nancy. <coughs> Cut it up. Oh, this is a graceful way to do that, wasn't there? <laughs> this is where, Nancy, you say, you know, this is my first time. I'm just starting my job. I really, you got to take pity on me, you know? Gotcha. That's all right. Nancy, I had asked everyone if they would sure, mind reading their mission statement. Yours looks to be fairly short. Do you have a copy of it right there in front of you? I do. The mission statement for the Finance Director Town Accountant's Office is to provide accurate, comprehensive, and accessible information to the citizens and officials of the town and to account for the management of town finances in accordance with federal, state, and local laws. Thank you. What is the technical services line? I always get confused in what department. Sure, the technical services line is our independent audit. That's the audit. And it was 80 last year? Yes, and that accounts for the interim town accountant services that oh. were procured. Right. Is it the same firm? Did we do a three year with them? Uh, we have a three year with them that's expiring and we're going to uh, take our option for another year with them. And it's Powers and Sullivan. So last year was 257, and this year it's 252. That's what I see. Yes. Personal services went up, but the uh, int well, it really didn't. Well, it did, but part of that 80 was really personal services anyway. So. Um. <coughs> Excuse me. Pretty straightforward. Joe, Marty, or, or Tony, that's that. Yeah. Do it. All right. Read that number again, somebody, or I will. It doesn't matter. 252,197 for mm -hmm. 15 compared to 257,119 of last year. Wasn't so bad, was it? No. Getting Jeez. off easy. Wait till next year. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. Nancy, Nancy thank, thank you. you. That does it for our budgets for this evening. If anyone has any walk-ins, <laughs> they left a long walk -in. <laughs> I think this should be at the end of the meeting. I like okay. that. That's good.
Moving over that, then, number 14 is the report for the week ahead from the town administrator. Oh. Yes, okay. First of all, I want to report. Can I interrupt you one second? Oh, sure. Dave, Mark, thank you guys. I appreciate yeah. Thanks for really. coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Tricia. Hold on, hold on. Too much. That's the advisory committee for all you. What would you say, thousands of viewers? Yeah, I had no chance. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, one, two, two quick things, one um, longer one. Um, the town received notification from EOEA that we got an electric charging station grant for $37,500. We put in for this grant a few months ago. So for people who have electric cars or electric whatever, we will have an electric charging station now. We got a grant to do that. So we, um, what does that mean exactly? Uh, probably around here, um, but we have to decide the location. So you hook up to it for free? Yep. For how long? Yep. Perpetuity or? No, if you need to charge and you can. No, what I'm saying, like, how long do we have that for? And before sooner or later, going to say we have to charge somebody for the electricity, I assume. It's going to start charging like free the gas for the rest of your life. Is it a right? solar? What what powers it? I have no idea. You can, you can tell we're green. <laughs> <laughs> I know where Rick Murray's going to I be did it one time. Like My electric car. car's been in the shop. <laughs> 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 Waiting for a charge. Oh, you've been getting those Teslas, huh? Is that it? We have uh, extra capacity right now. We're trying to sell our electricity, so uh, we can shut it <coughs> out. We can pull the plug if it becomes a problem. <laughs> yes. So anyway, I'm, well, that's I'm great. happy to do that. I think. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the board made a request to the Department of Revenue Division of Local Services <coughs> Technical Assistance Section to do a management analysis and look at the timetables for the budget. They've accepted that uh, request and will commence work in March. And I, it's a three to four month period. And um, so they've agreed to do that. So that's good move. Um, I think it was at your last meeting that I spoke at length about the FEMA appeals and one was accepted and one wasn't accepted and I talked about the one that was accepted and the basis of that appeal and how we were um, required to submit more information to FEMA upon their request for the um, appeal associated with the Woods Hole Group. Um, that is due What's tomorrow, Wednesday? Thursday, that will be hand-delivered to Boston. Um, both Duxbury and Marshfield are following similar trajectories with us, and we've been working together, having conference calls together, um, sharing costs together. There's an additional cost for them to supply the additional information. I believe it's $3,300 for us times three. So. Um, Woods Hole agreed to provide all that information and turn around a very short deadline, so we will meet all the requirements that FEMA. Now, the second um, appeal that we had with Ransom and Engineering, um, essentially <coughs> FEMA told us that they did not accept the methodology that Ransom used um, in their appeal. So Woods Hole took one approach, um, Ransom took another. The there's some concern around that because this is the same methodology that FEMA accepted in Southern Maine last year, and now they're not accepting it. And so Cumberland County and York counties in Maine had new maps, and even though the same methodology was used for the Castle <coughs> Bay area, FEMA did not <coughs> use it Plus for thing. Cumberland County and York County, Maine. So um, because the same methodology we used here was used up there. So they're all um, lobbying and very upset about FEMA's application of that. However, um, because FEMA didn't buy into the methodology for our second appeal, doesn't, it's not the end of the road for us. We can go to what's called a scientific panel resolution panel. And what that is, is it's a free of charge um, to apply panel um, that will allow us to make our case before an impartial tripartite um, group of um, technical and specialized individuals, not FEMA people, um, to, to make our case to them again. And so I had a rather lengthy phone conference today with Ransom and Marshfield um, about this very issue. Um, 
And what it is, is, um, hold on, let me look at my notes, um, is our basic contention is that the data that um, FEMA is using is more conservative than the elevations in the blizzard of 78. So what they're saying is, and we all know that the blizzard of 78 is considered the 100-year flood. And um, so what the subcontractor for FEMA did called STAR was that um, the blizzard of 78, the total tide total <coughs> was 11.5 inches, and FEMA is using 17, I mean 11.5 feet, FEMA is using 17 feet. So, um, and this is in Situate Harbor, not for the town as a whole, Situate Harbor specifically. So, um, and some of the things that we submitted in this um, appeal were out of the manual that FEMA and their subcontractor uses for some of their basic guidelines that they didn't even follow in their application. So all this has to be um, submitted tomorrow morning. Um, my email, I was checking my email at the beginning of the meeting because we have to fill out a rather extensive form to go to the scientific panel. Um, and then they have, I believe it's a 60-day period, don't hold me to that, Jessica, um, <coughs> where the panel's convened and um, we get to, to have another bite at the apple, as it were. And again, we're working with Marshfield on this, um, and um, I will keep you posted. Dave Ball had sent me an email early today. He wanted to know what was happening. I talked earlier about what's happening in Congress this week about Bigot Waters. Um, so that concludes my report. Great. Thank you. Agenda number 15 is to award the contract for the maintenance um, portion of Widow's Walk. We had mentioned that a while ago. It looks like it's going to stay with IGM by the looks of it. So it looks like there were two bidders? Two or three, yes. Yeah, two. The I think a third, one, right? a third took a, the RFP out and, and missed the deadline by 15 Through no fault in the own. They're, they're, oh, not they're, our fault, yeah, no. The bid right, deadline was t uh, 10 a.m. and it arrived at 10.30. Right. The FedEx Express. It was supposed to be here for 9 a.m. And I just was going to note that we have a nice, you know, um, note from a lot of local guys who use the course on a regular basis, much what Bob was alluding to, uh, you know, kind of like the bread and butter of the course. And, and they were saying nothing but nice things about, you know, the current company. And that's just nice to hear. But um, if not there aren't any questions or comments, I'd accept a motion. Will the Board of Selectmen vote to award the contract for golf maintenance to International Golf Maintenance of uh, Champions Gate, Florida, for three years with optional one-year extension in years four and five at the sole discretion of the Board of Selectmen for a first-year contract price of $475,311. A second year contract price of $482,441 and a third year contract price of $489,677. I have a motion and second. a second, please. Second. All right, I got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Okay. <coughs> Under item number 16, award the contract for the schematic design of the public safety complex. So um, this contract um, for the schematic design has taken a little bit longer than we anticipated. There was a number of machinations going back and forth between the architect and town council. Those were all finally resolved last week. The contract that you've seen we're comfortable with on both sides. And thank you, Kim, for catching that the motion should actually say to award for 60000 um, which was the price that was actually in the RFP. It's a fixed price. So, okay, so and Warren Whittier's started their work. We actually suspended their work pending the execution of this contract and the board's vote. So it's a $60,000 contract. It's to look at three different sites for a public safety building. Do the schematic design. Current one, current one here. Ellis, Ellis and, and Purple Dinosaur. Purple Dinosaur. And it goes from schematics to design, is that what you said? Yep, yeah. just yeah. Not, not full architecture or whatever, just schematic. On and he's already met with the chiefs. So. Okay. 
local company, Trisha, I just was looking to see. Yeah, he's oh, yes. here. Are they're they? out of Newbury Port for Don Walker, right. actually lives in town and used to Oh, there, yep, yeah, right there. Great. Super. Thought there was he's a connection. He's not on planning anymore, is he? No. 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 That's great. A motion? Move, That's Board of Selectmen, yep. award the contract and Got approve the letter of agreement for professional services for Doran Whittier Architects for the Public Safety Complex Feasibility Study and Schematic Design Services uh, DNW Project Number 13-0671 in the amount of $60,000. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Seventeen. <coughs> we vote um, donation of land on Shadwell Road. This was what I discussed before <laughs> the beginning of December about right. trying to get the property and try to use it. Of course, one of the problems that we found out at the last meeting from town administrator is that in order for us as a board to take it back as a town, we'd need to have to have a town meeting in order to ask the town meeting to authorize it. That being said, that means we'd have to wait until April. Uh, to when we have town meeting um, or we could vote to amend our prior vote so that it would go to um, the town but for conservation purposes not necess necessitating a town vote at that time I would probably propose to the board given the nature of the gift we should probably vote to amend our prior vote under the uh, instead of taking it for the board of selectmen that we take it for conservation restriction purposes um, yep. Does anyone have a problem with that? No. Who's the eight? Don't yet. Doesn't have to go to them first. Who? I think it goes Com -com. to Comcom. Is there a trust or something that has to hold it, or how does that, how does that work? No, it just goes. It just goes to Comcom. Town of Situate. Right. Okay. So, you want to rescind our vote from twelve three first? I, I would just vote to amend that vote instead of rescinding it. I just say I move to amend that vote of December third, twenty thirteen. Um, and vote that we um, um, accept the parcel known as number 39-26-25-0-R, small j, 26 Shad Road, uh, Shadwell Road um, for purposes of conservation and to be placed in the care and custody of the Conservation Commission. Right. Second. I'll accept that. A motion and a second. Second. And I have that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Takes care of 17. Some appointments on the Public Building Commission. Um, as we mentioned earlier, some user members for the library project. Will the Board of Selectmen um, appoint Jesse Finney, Library Director, and Karen Canfield, Library Trustee, as, quote, user members, unquote, of the Public Buildings Commission for the Library Project? Right. Second. Thanks, John. A motion, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Next, number 19, correspondence. Do we have anything else besides that letter? That's it. <coughs> we only had that letter we did earlier, right? Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything else. I move the Board of Selectmen vote to accept the regular session minutes for December 17th, 2013. Second. All right. I have a motion, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I wasn't here, so three to abstain. No, you were for the 17th, right? No, I was not. No. Oh. All right. Um... You I'll move meeting. the uh, Board of Selectmen vote to accept the executive session mis minutes not to release of January 22nd, 2013. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And um, just looking at it. Oh, that's a different. Just a second. Um, please cross out um, 82113 as Aye. far as executive session. Yep. I did that right. Okay. Yep. 820. So that'd be August. All right. So I'll move the Board of Selectmen vote to accept the executive session minutes, again, not to release, <clears throat> of June 18th, 2013, July 23rd, 2013, and December 17th, 2013. Uh, second. I have a motion and a second. I'll, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Except for executive session 1217, Kim. I was, again, not here. Right. <coughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yep. All right, so it takes care of our minutes, corresponds, other business. I'm going to start tonight, if you guys don't mind. I've been uh, on the board for almost 18 years, and almost 17 years, Kim Donovan has been our secretary. 
as we know, but my, much of the public doesn't, <clears throat> she's going to move on to big, you know, bigger and better things, things she's always wanted to do. She didn't really want me to do this, but I, I you know, I, I have to, you know. I, part of our job, you know, especially as chairman, we constantly talking to people at town hall. I cannot <clears throat> ever remember once, not even, if I couldn't reach Kim, she called me back. And each time one of us has ever had to call her, she's always been upbeat. I've never talked to her. She's been in a bad mood. No matter what happens here at Town Hall, no matter who comes in with a complaint, they're, they're our first line of defense. And I don't know what it's going to be like without Kim, without hearing her friendly voice. I just wish her the best. I'm going to miss hearing you at the other end of the phone. That's for sure. Thank you very much for everything you've done. Thank you. Thank and you. I hope I didn't embarrass you too much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate it. It's been a wonderful one wonderful job wonderful experience working with all of you it's just been it's been amazing for me the town Thank is you. very very lucky to have you i've never had a person say that you misspoke misstreated them in any way you. and you are very helpful when new selectmen come on board you teach them Absolutely. the ropes <laughs> you get them, you, you, you're very patient and you're you're very helpful through the process so I appreciate everything you've done for me as well. Yeah. Now tell us some dirt. You've seen a lot of selectors. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the... <laughs> um, I'm going to turn it over to Trisha before I let you guys speak, if that's all right. Well, um, Kim was also very helpful to me. She was actually my first point of contact applying for and interviewing and negotiating the contract. and. Um, I thought she ran the show and you didn't need a town administrator, <laughs> but, um, um, you know, everybody, Mara, we had that all those wonderful proclamations like the one Marty read earlier this evening, Kim writes and researches and she does, one of the wonderful things she does is makes those proclamations personal and all the myriad licensing and stuff. Um, her, she's a consummate professional. Um, she, her attention to detail and her meticulousness, I've, I've never seen in the quality that she has. But um, most of all, I think, is um, her customer service skills and our offices are particularly <coughs> blessed with Sheila and Kim um, to really treat people with respect and help them. Um, but the one thing I, I have to say about Kim um, that I love and I'll miss the most is she is her kindness. She's incredibly kind, and I'll miss her. Thank you very much. That was very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. I'll turn it over to other board members. John. Well, first and foremost, we're going to miss the candy jar, Kim. I mean, that's the one thing you always count on is getting candy. Huh? But I think the one thing that you learn as you begin to work in the workforce, whether it's public or private, um, is that you work with a lot of people. And um, it's great. They're all sorts. You know, people you enjoy working with, people who don't work well, people who are <coughs> lousy to work with, some people you just can't wait until they leave the job. The sad part is, is when you have somebody who's not just a good worker, but a great worker. And um, unfortunately, it's sad to see you go, because that's what this town is losing. We're losing it from our standpoint. I'm being selfish, because I hate to see you go. It's always, Sean's absolutely right, um, whether it's calling and trying to get information, um, whether it's emailing, you're very responsive, you're quick. Uh, you're very professional, uh, chiming and concurring with what uh, Trish is saying, you know, all that and more. And I think that's what's really difficult when you lose a quality person. Now, recognizing you're going to do other things that you've wanted to do, and I wish you well in that endeavor. But as I said to you when you called me, you know, I really hate to see you go because the town actually is the one who's going to be the biggest loss on it because they're the ones who interact with you the most with the calls and, and all the work that's done, whether it's the licensing or the minutes or the, um, um, you know, anything we're doing, the policies, you know, it's just, it's a breath of fresh air to be able to call and say, Kim, what do you think about this? What's going on? What's that? Um, that's something that we're going to lose, and that's something the town's going to miss. And all I can say is I wish you well, and Jim, in your endeavors, we'll see you around town, I know that, yeah. but it's just, it's hate, I hate to see you leave, because it's nice to have a constant <laughs> you can rely on, and when that's removed, um, you really miss it when it's gone, and I know we will. So I wish you well, and I thank you. Thank you very much. 
Kim, I just want to say, I mean, I didn't have that much time to work with you, but any time I need anything. That's why she's leaving, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But just a anything I've needed, you've pointed me in the right direction, and if, if you didn't have an answer, which most times you did, you certainly got it to me quickly, and, and good luck with everything you're doing. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll see you around town. Oh, you definitely will. Okay. I, won't, I won't be shy about no, it. No new board and committee appointees. <laughs> yeah. Good go. point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim. If we don't have any other business, I'll... No. Uh, just one, a couple real quick things. I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for the storm. This went very, very smoothly. I was surprised, although the media was trying to sensationalize it. Um, you know, the work of uh, the DPW, the fire, the police, Tricia, and all the other people that were here really was phenomenal. So that's, not it, the, that's not the Globe or the Mariner. We're talking about the... Yeah. TV stations exactly. that were sensationalizing. <coughs> the ones who put two helicopters in the air Saturday night just to see if they could, you know, get some kind of... I, I did a, a television 30-second spot, and they were disappointed that I wasn't saying anything. Well, but, but isn't the flooding bad? Isn't, you know, and like, <laughs> give us something. So I was, it was standing but, by my car, yeah. and I started for the first time in, like, two days to leave. Yeah. And I went over to say goodbye to the chief. And he was live on Channel 5. And I was like, oh, my God. And I walked out, and there were three more helicopters headed. And I had to come back here. I was here for another three hours. I saw All you. for not. Yeah. Well, thank God. Yeah. You know, thank right. goodness. You know, there's always the potential for a problem. And we were lucky in this one that we didn't get anything. Um, just a quick sports update. We're in winter season, basketball games, hockey games. Basketball team just won tonight, a little while ago over there. They won the Duxbury tournament last weekend and are 4-0. And I think the hockey team is maybe 3-2. They're having a good season as well. And uh, I just want to add one thing. I went over to the studio over there, um, Citrus Cable Television, because we're trying to film these games and get them on, on the public. So, so if you have any interest in helping film it or have content that you want, they're looking for it over there. Um, and it was really impressive. I don't know if you guys have been over there to look it's at it. Unbelievable. There's a lot of equipment, really, the potential nice. to do a lot of stuff there. So I think we're, we're on the brink of, of doing stuff there. It's really just content that we're waiting to come through the door. But Tony, on that. Yeah. And, and Tricia, with the possibility of like our strategic plan with Gates and everything, it's a, and granted, I don't know if the um, uh, SETV is going to still remain at the high school, but is it possible to like do these in the new facilities or the renovated facilities from the high school or from one location instead of having somebody in the back of the room do it? In other words, literally have the camera set up in the room so that you could tape it from another site to just put the cameras on and not have to have somebody physically come. You could have one person at one know. location. I don't know. Maybe. Just I something I was thinking long term. I'll tell you one thing. This room is about 50 degrees warmer than the room over there. So they, yeah. I'm sure she's happy to be here. But, um, but uh, no, it's a very good facility. If you can get over and look at it, and again, reaching out to people out there that want to get involved in public television um, who have different ideas, the, the tools are there to, to put stuff into production. So I want to thank John for uh, giving me the tour there. On your sports um, update there, Tony, do you know anyone on the basketball team by any chance? Quite a, quite a lot of good players okay. over there. All yeah. right, I just didn't know if any I heard, members I heard Brian anything. James. Okay. Give him a little kudos tonight. <laughs> All right. Hit a three-pointer with 19 seconds left to beat Whitman. So. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn at 8.59 p.m. In a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Guys. Good night, folks. Good night. Thank you.